Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are convening the Planning and Development Public Hearing. Uh, today is March 10th, 2023. It is now 11.04 a.m. Uh, before I get to my colleagues and uh, their comments, I just want to remind everyone that we do time our speakers to three minutes. So we are not being rude when we ask you to wrap up. We're just asking you to wrap up because everybody gets three minutes. I'd also say that if there's more than one of you, you still get three minutes. So <laughs> we welcome your testimony. We're always happy to talk to you after the fact as well. So thank you for being here today. Senator Raman, do you have any comments this morning? Sure. Good morning, everyone. So nice to see you all again. We have a number of uh, bills for a public hearing and looking forward to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Fazio. Good morning, Madam Chair. Looking forward to our conversation today. Um, so we'll get right to it. Representative Zulu will be joining us shortly. I'm sure he probably is ready to get started as well. So we'll start with number one, Representative Amy Morin Bello. Amy, welcome. Thank you for having me today. Um, good morning, Chairs Kavros de Gras and Raman, Vice Chairs, Ranking Members, and Committee Members. I am Amy Morin Bello. I am the State Representative for the 28th District of Wethersfield, and I'm here today speaking in support of House Bill 6806, an act authorizing the deferral of a property revaluation. Um, I am joined today in the room by our town manager, our mayor, and our uh, newly hired assessor. Weathersfield had a vacancy in its assessor position, and that has um, required us to request a one-year um, extension for the reval uh, for the town of Weathersfield. I appreciate the committee drafting this bill, and I hope that you will support it and that we can get this passed through the House and Senate. Um, and while I'm here today, I will just briefly express my support also for HB 6800, and act concerning electronic book and digital audiobook licensing. We have a similar bill in GAE that um, we had hearing on earlier. Um, our libraries are such invaluable services for our communities. And to have publishers um, charging exorbitant fees for our libraries to provide ebooks is inconscionable. And I hope that we can um, address this so that our communities can access ebooks just like we do um, and with a reasonable cost associated with it. Because obviously, we want uh, authors and publishing companies to make money. Um, but not to the extent where communities are not able to provide these um, resources to our residents. So thank you so much for your time today. If you have any questions. Thank you so much. Seeing no questions at this time, have a great afternoon and good thank luck in your you. other meetings. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Michael Rell, who will be joined by Fred Presley and Walter Topliff. Welcome, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, co-chairs. Raman, Cavros de Gras, Ranking Member Fazio, Ranking Member Zulo, if he's back on, and distinguished members of the uh, P&D Committee. For the record, my name is Michael Rell. I am the mayor of Wethersfield. And for this testimony, I will take off my lobbyist badge and put on my uh, mayor's hat for today. Uh, with me today uh, before you is um, our um, town manager, Fred Presley. Town Assessor Walter Toplift, and as you just heard from uh, Representative Amy Bello, uh, we are here to testify in support of House Bill 6806, an act authorizing the deferral of property revaluation. Uh, this bill would allow the town of Wethersfield to delay for just one year the revaluation of real property in our town. Um, and now I will turn it over the rest of my time to both Walter and Fred to talk specifics on the situation of the one year delay. Good morning. Um, I'm here today to request the one year uh, delay in the revaluation with the caveat that we go back to the regular schedule in four years. I think that's important because legislation was passed last year uh, outlining specific uh, areas. Um, I started on February 6th, uh, and we have an October 1st, 2023 revaluation due. Uh, 
all the revaluation companies have been uh, hired for that cycle and to find somebody to do the work at this time would be, um, you know, just not possible to have a quality work done. And, um, but the good news is the town already has their 2024 re RFP out for the revaluation. We're the first ones out. So uh, we thank you for your consideration today. In the three minutes. That was really good. <laughs> I was waiting to see if there was anything else. Any uh, do, we have, do you have a question from Representative Delnicki? Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. So, and that is the title that uh, I cherish, having had the opportunity to do what you are doing currently. So, so basically, this is a function of to get the grand list appropriately done based on hiring a new assessor that you need the extra year. Is that fair? That is fair. And let's face it, the function of getting an appropriate grand list is something that you cannot take lightly. Is it definitely not. It's the responsibility of the assessor, the town as a whole, to ensure that taxpayer funds are uh, adequ adequately recorded as well as uh, uh, from our role adequately spent. So you are using a best practice here based on the fact that you had a situation of having to hire a new assessor and the fact you didn't have one in place in time to actually get this done appropriately is the extenuating circumstance that you have before you. Correct. I would say it was nine months. If I may, but Fred Presley, town manager. Um, we had actually attempted to hire a new assessor. We had to go out twice. Um, the assessor market is very challenging right now. Um, we had to, once it went out the first time, we offered it to uh, three different applicants. And it was the money that we had uh, set for that position was not adequate because of the market right now. Um, we had to go back to the unions to negotiate a change and lift that salary up, go back out again. That took several months and it put us in the position that we we're at today. Well, I can certainly appreciate the need to hire a quality individual that can do the job and to have a properly certified grand list. And I thank you for your testimony, Mr. Mayor. And I, I certainly think what you have requested here is reasonable based on the extenuating circumstances. Thank, thank you, you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'm seeing no other questions at this time, but I just would comment that I don't think you're the only town in this position by any stretch of the imagination. So I have a feeling we'll be hearing from some other towns that may want to join your legislation. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming today and have a great weekend. Thank you. Up next, we have Martin Haft and on deck is Gabe Rosenberg. Welcome, Mr. Haft. Good morning, uh, chairs, ranking members. On average, 280 authorizations and 425 reimbursements, all separate, are processed annually. The legislation recommends the elimination of the current time-intensive per-project authorization and per-project reimbursement process by converting LOSIP to an annual single payment formula entitlement program. The state's $60 million town aid road program and 91 million municipal grants and aid program are administered in the same fashion as we are presenting here. LOSIP is a $30 million project. LOSIP projects are clearly defined in statute. Allowable expenditures are clearly defined uh, in our program guidelines, and the program is subject to the provision of the state single audit act. 
We're also at requesting to add an annual reporting provision, which is also part of the Town Aid Road Municipal Grants and Aid Program, which allows OPM to review and ensure funds are only being spent on allowable projects and for allowable expenditures. And I thank you for the opportunity and happy to answer any questions anyone has. Thank you so much. Seeing no questions at this time, <laughs> you know what that means. <laughs> have a good weekend. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Up next, we have Gabe Rosenberg from the Secretary of State's office and uh, followed by Tom Br Bradham. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Hi. Uh, thank you, co-chairs uh, Rahman and Kavros de Gras, ranking members Fazio and Zulo, and members of the committee for allowing me to speak to you today. Uh, my name is Gabe Rosenberg. I'm here representing the Secretary of the State's office uh, in support of Senate Bill 1140, an act concerning the appointments of justices of the peace. Uh, our office has a small role in the appointment process, and we recently became aware that the statutory framework for the appointment of justices um, does not allow for the filling of vacancies created by a change in town charter that adds justice of the peace positions. Um, <clears throat> SB 1140 would fix part of this issue by allowing town clerks to make appointments of unaffiliated or minor party electors to fill those very specific vacancies, but only if the town clerk had more applicants than positions at the previous quadrennial appointment. Uh, we've submitted language to the committee chairs that would also address the filling of that's those specific vacancies allotted to electors of the two major parties. Uh, as well as making it possible for town clerks to fill uh, any vacancies in the Justice of the Peace positions allotted to electors who are not members of either major party. Um, additionally, after speaking with the representatives of the Justice of the Peace Association, we proposed creating a working group to study some of the issues around the statutory framework, uh, including the number of positions that are uh, allocated to each town, portability of appointments across town lines, uh, potential training and, and qualifications, um, and, and basically anything else that that would come up. Um, we support uh, SB 1140 and hope that you'll take some of the additional issues that I raised today into consideration. Uh, our office will be happy to work with the committee and proponents of the bill on acceptable language. Um, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. It sounds like we are trying to get to the problem, but we haven't quite gotten to the root of it based on your testimony. Is that accurate? I think that's accurate. Yes. Okay. So at, at this point, I think, as you said, you know, I appreciate the offer for help offline because I think we're going to need to make sure that we do get to the bottom of it. And I'm, I'm grateful that you're supportive of the bill, but just that we probably need more language. So I appreciate that. Uh, any questions? Any discussion? Okay. Thank you so much for being thank here you. today. Up next, we have Tom Bradham. Again, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, followed by Alexis Harrison. Hello, my name is Tom Bradham. Hey. Can you hear me? Thank you. Good morning, Co-Chairman Kavros de Graw and Co-Chairman Rahman and members of the Planning and Development Committee. My name is Tom Bradham. I am a resident of Mystic and, and, and am here speaking to you today as a member of a community grassroots organization known as Groton Homes, Not Hotels. Our organization supports Senate Bill number 1137, an act concerning short-term rental facilitators and properties. We all know that the top tourist attractions in the state are located in Groton, Mystic, Stonington, and our neighboring towns of Eastern Connecticut. In the last few years, short-term rental operators have also discovered the appeal of our shoreline communities. Our concern is that the short-term rental industry has shifted in scope from mom and pop local ventures into the significant involvement of investment firms and real estate investment companies, often from outside Connecticut. These corporate entities whose ownership is often well hidden behind layers of limited liability companies are changing the character of our shoreline communities. These investment groups are purchasing single family homes in our historic neighborhoods and transforming them into boutique hotels in defiance of local zoning regulations. These hotels operate without rules and regulations and cause a tremendous loss of neighborhood instability. They cause tremendous um, neighborhood instability. These commercial entities are supported in their work by the short-term rental facilitators, namely Airbnb, VRBO, 
Home Away, Marriott Bonvoy, and the like. On any given day in Mystic alone, we estimate that more than 600 short-term rental properties are available to rent. These are commercial properties in our residential neighborhoods that are not available for residents. We need to do everything we can to ensure that our family housing remains available for lease and purchase by our residents and our workers in our shoreline communities. We ask the committee to support the additional tax levy on short-term rental facilitators and operators. We also ask the committee to make perfectly clear that short-term rentals, as defined in state statutes, are commercial entities and are subject to the land use authority of local zoning commissions. We also request that the committee assert that our city and town governments have the clear legal authority to develop legislation to govern the practices of short-term rental operators and facilitators through ordinances or other methods. In closing, I would like to acknowledge the support and assistance of Representative Andre Bumgardner from Groton and Stonington, Stonington to our grassroots organization. Andre has been a steadfast supporter of our efforts while a member of the Groton Town Council and now as our state representative. Thank you, Andre. And finally, if I may, a shout out to Vice Chair Brandon Chafee. I don't know if Representative Chafee is with you, but I worked with Representative Chafee's mother for over 30 years as we endeavored to make the Connecticut Community Colleges affordable to our many residents. Give my best to your mom, Brandon. Thank you all for providing me with the opportunity to address the committee today. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Mr. Bradham. Um, Representative Chafee is in another meeting right now, but I will more okay. than happily uh, extend those <laughs> regards to him on behalf of you to his mom. Um, absolutely okay. lovely and a wonderful way to start the day. Uh, so any questions at this time? Seeing no questions, thank you so much for your testimony. Thank have you. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Up next, we have Alexis Harrison uh, and then followed by Tom Donato. Ms. Harrison, are you in the room? I, I'm actually um, on webinar. Okay. Okay, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Good morning. Um, you know, uh, good morning, um, Chairman Kavroth DeGraw, uh, Chairman Rahman, and members of the Planning and Development Committee. Uh, I'm Alexis Harrison. I'm a president of CT 169 Strong. We're a grassroots group dedicated to our 169 unique communities in Connecticut and local control. Um, I also wear another hat. I serve on the Town Plan and Zoning Commission in Fairfield. You know, over the years, I've, you know, had the good opportunity to testify on a number of bills here. And, um, you know, largely many of these bills are, are being, you know, pushed by housing advocates, lobbyists, and what have you. But what I've noticed is there's been a big void from the conversation are all stakeholders, whether it's an environmentalist, engineer, you know, professional planner. And, and I really, you know, behoove this committee to, to get the experts here because I think, you know, these, these bills are really important and we need all stakeholders at the table. Um, again, I became involved in zoning because I care deeply about our environment. You know, our land is one of the most finite of resources. You can't move land, you can't make more land, and it's all it's on all of us to be good stewards. And I really believe when we come together and coalesce, you know, real progress can be made. You know, that's that's the spirit of our of our American experiment. Um, I just want to note just some issues with the SB 1141 and that concerning um, TOD. First of all, this is not a TOD bill, and I think that's misleading. You know, TOD focuses on mixed use communities, you know, centered around high quality and, and uh, transit systems. This, this bill is really a housing development bill, and it largely ignores commercial development that is critically important to TOD. Um, you know, here in Connecticut, we don't really have fast or high quality transportation. You know, no one is really going to a dinner party via Metro North. Uh, we just don't have that infrastructure right now. And it's also a density mandate that requires less affordability than most towns require in our TOD zones. Um, and I really think it um, restricts the ability of towns like Fairfield, where I live, um, to develop and continue with its own TOD work. Um, Fairfield has been doing TO work for years. Um, we have a really vibrant um, TOD community. Um, and, and again, this, this bill does not represent any new thinking or vision. It's a retread of last year's desegregate bill, I think, that, that failed. Um, and then I, what, bit, what also struck me in this bill is as of right language that's mentioned six times. And as a planning commissioner, I have to say, I rely probably just like you do on the voices of our residents 
to share input on projects that will impact our community. You know, twice a month for the past um, almost two years, I've had the pleasure of serving on our board and hearing from neighbors. You know, they know what's best, you know, right down to traffic patterns, noise issues, wildlife, and other nuances. You know, muting that public voices would be a horrible mistake. Um, I did submit written testimony, and I know I am on a time limit, so I, I just want to um, get through um, other notes I have made on SB 985. Um, you know, there are aspects of this bill that I really do support, and it's it's a good start. It's well intended, but I think there are modifications that need to be made. Um, you know, one of the most concerning parts of the bill is the development of TOD housing other than middle market housing as of right. And it would require the municipal approval by the board of a uh, zoning board of appeals versus the, the the planning and zoning commission, which I'm not sure if is, is a mistake or not. Um, again, there's no requirement for the PNZ sewer commissions, water or wetlands to have input. So to me, that's unworkable and doesn't really reflect the proper planning process that most towns have been doing for many years. That's just not good common sense and not good policy. Thank um, you so much. I believe you didn't hear the clerk say that you're. Oh, time I'm sorry. Completed. Sorry, That's Chairman. Okay. All right. uh, no, thank you very much for uh, coming today. Do I? I do have a uh, Senator Fazio, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Harrison, um, and appreciate all your um, your strong advocacy work. I mean, a lot of these issues are very complicated, and having uh, you know regular citizens uh, and members of municipal governments helping to inform the work of us as legislators is very, very useful. Uh, and, and so certainly we appreciate the informativeness and the um, advocacy that you and, and others have provided. Um, the, the TOD bill that you referred to, it, it strikes me as pretty heavy handed. I mean, we see a lot of these um, zoning bills and proposals of different varieties come through our committee and another committee. But um, would you say that this one kind of represents something that is a, a little bit more on the heavy handed side compared to the others that have both carrots and sticks in them? And you're referencing um, 1141? Correct. Okay, yes. It, it is a top down um, centralized approach to zoning. Um, and I also, you know, wanted to mention that most of our train stations, you know, you, you live in Greenwich, I live in Fairfield, they're really close to our coastlines. And we know climate change is real. You know, our sea levels are rising. In fact, in Fairfield, when we have major rainstorms, we're seeing, you know, major problems. So I, and even our own DEP says, um, can, you know, confirms that. So I think we have to be really careful how we plan around our train stations. And that, I don't see how that has been taken into account into this into this bill, unfortunately. Yeah, and and as you reference, I uh, I live in a relatively dense part of the state, um, but a, but a town, and and you do too. And there are transit stations that are um, that are surrounded by single family. There are others that are surrounded by mixed use. Uh, you know, the uh, the transit stations can be very different one to the other, and right. the you know amount of public transportation that those transit stations uh, end up putting through as well can be very different one to the other. So the idea that we'd have uniform state imposed zoning regulations um, all for uh, for every transit station in the exact same way uh, really strikes me as uh, ill-considered. Um, you know, you you as a zoning official, I imagine consider when you're when you're considering these types of, of issues, you you're not applying one rule to everything. You're actually looking at the implications on different communities and its infrastructure uh, and its uses and so on. Yeah, absolutely. And TOD is a great idea and it's very visionary. Um, you know, but when we make decisions on TOD, like you said, we do it that, you know, with with issues that are commensurate with our own infrastructure, with our own, you know, built environment, with our natural resources. And everything is just so unique. Land is unique. You know, what is good for Avon may not be good for Greenwich or Fairfield, but, you know, vice versa. So I think we just have to be really mindful of, of the good work that our local PNCs do. You know, you know, and I, again, muting any public voice from any consideration of an application to me is just bad government. That's not democratic. And it just, it, it really, you I know, mean, makes me upset, quite frankly. And um, I was also interested in your testimony on 985. You know, it, it was it was nuanced. Um, can can you talk about the things that you probably think are the best parts of the governor's proposal and the and the worst parts from uh, from your vantage point as a municipal uh, zoning official? Yeah, certainly. Uh, well, a lot of it. Again, I think it's a good place to start. 
Um, some issues I just didn't don't like are bringing in the, the zoning board of appeals and only have one hearing. I don't know why we, we would ever want to limit the hearing process. You know, most of the hearings that we do in Fairfield sometimes are two, four meetings, even more. Um, it just it matters. You know, we all do our due diligence. We hear from a number of experts. So I think limiting it is is really, you know, just uncomfortable for me. Um, you know, some good things is I think, you know, housing production is a good thing. And I'm, and I'm glad to see the governor do this. Um, but I, I would just say I, we need to have all stakeholders involved. And, and I think this is a good starting point, but we need to do more. We need to bring anyone involved. Um, it, it's some, and again, also bring, not bringing in the sewer commission, water, wetlands, conservation, historic commissions. That's just, you know, unworkable. Um, and, I, and I'm sure most of us would agree with that. Well, I appreciate your your um, in, uh, informative testimony, your your experience, your hard work as a local zoning official. Uh, you know, I can see from the towns and cities I represent how much time, thanklessly, that our zoning officials spend. Uh, we want to make sure we empower those local leaders. Um, not Absolutely. Totally them. And I'd also say there's also a parking issue. I think I'm not sure I went really quickly because of the time limit, but there, you know, there's no parking requirement in this either. Um, and I think that's just something, you know, you and your committee need to look at. And, and I appreciate the questions and the time this morning. Thank you. And there's actually no time limit on Q&A, but I will okay. uh, question time now and uh, appreciate the indulgence of the chair. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I have a couple questions as well, because I was taking notes as you were talking. And I am a little confused because on the one hand, you said that we don't uh, let mm -hmm. experts and, and people who are conservationists or, or, or other experts in the field that we are not listening to them. But then you also said that it's the public who we really need to be listening to. And the public isn't always necessarily an expert in their field. No, yeah. So so who are who who is it that you think we should be listening to the most? I, I mean, everybody, I mean, plant, I mean, certainly I am, I am, I happily sit and proudly sit on my zoning commission, but would I call myself an expert in planning? No, but I think we need to bring in planners. I don't know who writes the bills. I don't know the sausage making, Madam Chair. So I, but I, I think listing and to everyone is, is really important for all of us. I, I, the, I see these being pushed by housing advocates. Housing advocates play a very important role, but there are also other people who may say this doesn't really work. Have you guys talked to the planners, the engineers, economists, environmentalists? Um, so I would say bring in all the experts. You know, I work in the private sector, and when, when when we make big decisions, we bring in everybody. We consider the risk, the cost analysis, and so forth. Yes, and that's why we have these public hearings so that we can have as many people speak in these um, circumstances or submit written testimony that yeah. we can refer to. No, I appreciate the time. Thank you. Are you familiar with uh, the Commission on Connecticut's Development and Future? Yes, I am. So you know that we have a lot of zoning officials that serve on that and our COG. Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually a member of, of the sewage commission, of the, yeah, of the subcommittee and been working with Senator Cohn for the past year on that and, and so many others. Are, are you happy with some of the work that's going on with that commission? I think some of the, per, the conversations have been very productive. Yeah, absolutely. And if they made recommendations that were perhaps similar to this and didn't seem to align with some of the other things that you talked about, would you be supportive of those? I would have to, I would have to evaluate it. Um, I, you know, it's hard to support something that's hypothetical, but I'm, I'm always open and would love to see ideas that benefit all of our communities. And keeping in mind our 169 unique towns and cities, what would be your solution in terms of the affordable housing and crisis that we face? Because we all know that, you know, I, I've, my eldest is 22. I've got a 19 and a 13. I'm thinking about the fact that, you know, they probably can't do what I did and come to Connecticut right after I graduated college to start a family and start my life um, because of the lack of affordable housing. Um, they're going to be home with me for a while, most likely. So um, when it comes to, you know, our seniors who want to downsize, my, my question is, is what would your solution be to making sure that we have the affordable housing that we need in Connecticut, knowing that it's a nationwide crisis? Sure. Yeah. And, and yeah, I appreciate that. And, you know, I think we have more of an affordable affordability issue in Connecticut versus a, a crisis. Um, you know, look, I was a poor journalist many years ago, and I had several roommates to because I wanted to stay in Fairfield. Yeah, I couldn't afford my own place at the time. Um, we've all been young, and, and I totally appreciate that. Um, I think towns need to get seed money from the state to build 100% affordability um, units. You know, right now we're largely dependent on developers. To, to create afford, you know, affordability units, or excuse me, affordable units in our towns. And we need real seed money from the state to, to do that. And perhaps maybe there's some work to do with the vouchers. Um, I think there's a number of ways other than just putting a top-down approach to, to our cities and towns that we cherish. 
Okay. Um, so, and, and I think reform state 30 G are also something that we haven't really looked at deeply and, and had honest conversations about 830 G is also a very flawed uh, formula when creating affordable housing in the, in the state. Well, thankfully, 830G is not uh, on the table today, and it's not usually handled by this committee. No, I know it's not handled by your committee, certainly, but you asked. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Have a pleasant weekend. You too. Thank you, Chairwoman. Up next, I have uh, Tom Donato and followed by Deborah Shander. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Representative Cabros de Gras and Senator Roman, and Planning and Development Committee members. My name is Tom Denote, Assessor for the City of Bristol. I am also the Legislative Committee Co-Chair for the Connecticut Association of Assessing Officers. Please accept this testimony today in support of House Bill 6801, the submission of income and expense information in connection with the assessment of income producing real property. Commercial occupied property drives the state's local economy through services, in some cases entertainment and the employment they provide. Commercial property equitable valuation is imperative to all assessors. When valuing commercial property, assessors consider the three approaches to value, which are the sales comparison, cost approach, and income approach. Employing the income approach to value relies on good data, which is instrumental in any commercial transaction appraisal. Specifically, the income and expense report contains vital information which the assessor, which helps the assessors track commercial property rent and expense trends. A recent example notes the upward trending apartment market monthly rent charges. I annually process approximately 1,100 income and expense reports for the city of Bristol. These reports allow me the ability to dialogue with the property owner firsthand local market fluctuations, not only for the property income generation, but also the expenses that may be incurred out of unexpected circumstances, such as utility flu cost fluctuate fluctuation, extreme weather related events, and necessary replacement of outdated building improvements that are typically capitalized. Please note this information is protected from Freedom of Information Law 1-210. Assessors applaud House Bill 6801 positive revision to Connecticut General Statute 1263C, which would allow a failure to file an income and expense report penalty adjustment to the current grant list. It'll also allow a commercial property owner the ability to have a United States Postal Service postmark count for a timely filing and allow a commercial property owner the ability to request a filing extension by the report filing deadline, June 1st, rather than May 1st. The current May 1st extension request deadline has confused many property owners since it is 30 days prior to the filing deadline. For these reasons, please support House Bill 6801 since each assessor's goal is to evaluate a commercial property based on local market factors and on the fair market negotiated rental stream supported for each commercial property within their municipality. Thank you for granting me this time to speak with you today. I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you so much and thank you for being here today. Representative Zawistowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you had mentioned about the three approaches to value. Um, what would what would an assessor do if they did not get the income information, income and expense information? How, how would they go about uh, valuing the property? Yeah, we would have to look at other surveys of similar properties and look at the sales comparison approach. Um, there are other data sources such as, you know, Corpaz analyzes sales and they do contact real estate agents and try to find out that information that was utilized in the purchase of the commercial property. Um, it's very difficult. Um, there are a lot of man hours that would have to go into that, subscription fees, things of that nature, when the data is readily available to um, the local property owner. And um, it is currently shared right now. The city of Bristol just went through a 2022 revaluation. And without this information, it would have been very difficult to um, evaluate these commercial properties. 
would you say that um, that uh, if you don't have this information that you would have, uh, it would be very difficult to come up with an accurate value for the property? Very true statement, correct. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Seeing no other questions at this time, thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you, you too. Up next, we have Deborah Shander, followed by Loretta J. Welcome, Ms. Shander. Good morning, Senator Rahman, Representative Navros Debra, and distinguished members of the committee. I am State Librarian Deborah Shonder, and I am here to speak about HB 6800 concerning fair terms and contracts and licenses for electronic books for libraries. We appreciate the opportunity to share a perspective with you today. The advent of ebooks in both text and audio form dramatically shifted the relationship between libraries and publishers and has moved us from traditional purchasing to renting collections through licensing. These licenses are undeniably crafted in ways that benefit publishers to the detriment of libraries and greatly affect our mission to provide equitable access of information to everyone. Libraries face significantly steeper costs than consumers. We must pay those costs again and again to maintain access to the same content. We are limited in who we can lend those items to and for how long and in what way. And we may not even be given the option to access them at all. Our autonomy to make decisions about how to lend eBooks has been taken from us. We have had to surrender our mission to the terms that publishers have put on these licenses. Thanks to 2013 legislation, Connecticut first conducted a study of this matter, and then in 2015 allocated bonding funds to the State Library to develop the first statewide ebook platform of its kind. But those measures are not enough. The underlying issues that led to that study and led to that platform remain, and they continue to impact every library in this state and across the country. In recent years, legislators and librarians from across the country have questioned this existing model through bills like HB 6800. Every bill has faced significant legal pushback from publishers who obscure the issues with talk of federal preemption and conversations about the free market. But that is all their words are, obfuscation. Here are the facts. In order to acquire an electronic book for its collection, a library's only option is a license offered on unsustainable and unfair terms. And Connecticut has the right as a state to say that the terms of these contracts and these licenses are unfair and they're, discri un they're discriminatory and to pass legislation that is equitable for libraries and publishers alike. We know from past response, this is a complicated matter. Any legislation Connecticut passes has to be comprehensive and responsive to the needs of many different types of libraries and the diverse sets of patrons that they serve. Ask, we ask that you address both the concerns of public libraries and re research libraries. Consider leisure readers, those who need audiobooks, not just like them, and set equitable terms. We will continue to pay for the um, materials that we want. We will continue to support authors with our purchases and our recommendations, but as it currently stands, the relationship between libraries and publishers on electronic books is too far unbalanced. They should not be able to continue dictating our library mission through Your these time unreasonable is terms. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. That was to the second. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony today. Could you give us an example of what you know you pay for an electronic book versus what when I'm sitting at home and purchase one on, say, my Kindle, um, what the, the cost differential is? Absolutely. So typically, libraries are asked to pay somewhere between 3 and 10%. Uh, I've been handed data. Excuse <laughs> me. Um, <laughs> Let me give you some specific examples. So Stephen King's recent book, Fairy Tale, uh, it would cost $32 as the hardcover. A library would pay about 17. Um, it would be $69 for a library to purchase that book. And unlike you, when you purchase it and get to keep it for the rest of your reading life, a library would have to pay for that book again, either after two years or 26 borrows. So essentially the moment that that book is used, even if it is not used in that time, it disappears and a library would have to pay for it again. There are examples across that. Um, audiobooks are actually even more expensive than electronic books in many cases. Uh, and we've seen that shift just recently. It used to be that an audiobook was a perpetual license. A library could keep it forever. And now publishers have also shifted that to being these limited terms as well. So those are just a couple of examples of the costs that a library would have to pay. 
And typically say with a bestseller, how many copies would you purchase for a library? Is there like an average? And, and then I guess that the number that you just gave being so much higher, that would probably, you would buy less electronic copies, I would guess, right? Absolutely. Yes. So public libraries are typically, uh, and you'll hear from my, my learned colleagues from public libraries a little bit later, but um, typically they are there to make sure that they meet their patrons' needs at the time a book is requested. So if the new Stephen King, the new books from those popular authors come out, a library is want, going to want to buy multiple copies. It could be 10, it could be 25, however many they have estimated their patrons may want. And you multiply that by the high costs that you are seeing. Uh, and then in public libraries, what we see is maybe the interest wanes, maybe there isn't. And then you have to buy the next popular book because that one has come out too. And so libraries are being hit over and over again by those high costs. Uh, at the State Library, what we try to do with that platform that we have built is the more, um, the less popular books, the ones like Persuasion or Shakespeare or the books that you could maybe uh, want to access in other ways when you're done reading your James Patterson, we can provide that. We pay those exact same costs uh, that a public library, that an academic library would do. We see those books disappear from our shelves in the same way that public and other libraries do. So it is something that impacts every type of library, regardless of who they serve uh, and what they are trying to do. And those costs are just perpetuated, as you said, by the need for multiple copies. Wow, that, that's quite the expense to cities and towns. Uh, any other questions? Representative Zalstowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this is this is um, a question because I, I, out of curiosity, I've never borrowed an ebook from a library. What is the procedure? Is there anything physical that the, the borrower actually gets or do you uh, send a download key or something? So it can depend on the um, platform that you're using, but typically these days you would probably have an app on your phone if you have a smartphone. Uh, it might be that you have a Kindle device. Um, some libraries actually purchase and lend out the physical Kindle themselves so that somebody who can't buy it can access it that way. Uh, but you would download it. Um, you would receive a protected copy of that book on your device. So there is uh, software built into it that after your one week, two week loan period, that book will disappear from your collection and it will go on to the next person. Um, and so one of the things that publishers have said is, well, we can't protect those books. If they're a digital, anybody could lend it out. You could give it to somebody else. There is protection in place and we do use that. Um, but it often depends, to get back to your kind of original question, you do need to have some sort of physical device in order to access it. Most recently, kind of smartphones, but it might be a Kindle or another reader that you would have. Okay, thank you. My question is you know, whether, whether or not somebody actually had to show up at the library if they had a, a smartphone, which apparently not. No. Can you actually um, let a patron borrow, more, borrow two different patrons borrow a, an ebook at the same time? It depends on the licensing terms that the publishers have set. Um, there are some, for example, the Hoopla app, which is a very popular app. It allows for simultaneous access. The costs tend to differ depending on whether you have simultaneous or one person at a time lending, uh, but other lenders only allow you to borrow them one at a time, just like a physical book. And that's why you see very long wait lists, for example, to access a book. It depends on the terms that the library is offered. They usually are not offered the choice. Okay, thank you. And I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm totally astounded that people just don't realize even when they buy one of these eBooks that they don't actually own it. And um, that's correct. The private consumer does not, you do not own your eBooks any more than a library does, mm -hmm. um, which is something that people do not realize. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank Absolutely. you, Madam Chair. Yes, this is an absolutely fascinating discussion. Uh, we do have a question from Senator Wong, of course, who's the proponent of the bill. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, welcome, Ms. Shander. Um, Thank you for your great work. And before we talk about the bill, I want to take an opportunity and, and, and ask you to share the important critical role that our libraries do in our community beyond just books and electronic books. Uh, can you take a moment and just kind of really articulate how expansive your services are? Absolutely. Um, 
we, we continue to be have people assume that we are books. Um, we are much more than books. So, for example, at the start of the pandemic, I was an academic law library director. Um, we had students who were begging us to reopen the library because they were in a one room apartment. They had nowhere to go to study, to spend, to get away from their families, to get away from the distractions that were keeping them from their work. And they said, please just reopen the library so that I can have a study space. I can have a place to go. Um, there are, uh, we also offer, for example, services for new immigrants and citizens, whether that's learning English as a second language, whether that's about how to um, pass the immigration tests that you need in order to become a citizen. It might be that you are uh, creating story walks or time for families to come together and read, to talk about different topics. It could be book clubs, things that are related to books, but it can also be uh, simply a community space. You can go to a gardening program at a library. You can go, uh, if you're an entrepreneur, you can get the resources that you need to set up your first business. Um, you can uh, rent out a space that you can use as a place where you can have offices and meet with people. Um, those are just a couple of examples of what libraries provide. Uh, and it is, and that list is a very short list in comparison with what uh, libraries are offering to uh, their communities. Thank you for the question. Absolutely. And, and I think you've seen that uh, service need increase exponentially during COVID and continue on as people have discovered libraries. Your budgeting for each of your respective libraries come from municipalities. And the reason I asked about all the critical and important services you provide is they come at a cost that it's funded by municipal budgeting and your fundraising by friends of the various libraries. This cost savings from these book disparities are a critical, critical tool to help you provide these critical services without adding burden to taxpayers. Can you kind of articulate some of the economics of? how if this was more fair and more equitable, um, that more of these critical services could be provided uh, from our libraries to consumers. Absolutely. So just to give you a little bit of a framework, uh, most public libraries are funded at, all public libraries in Connecticut are funded at a local level, whether that's through their municipality directly, private funds, or some mix. Um, and what we see in Connecticut is very low numbers in terms of that support. So for example, the average public library in Connecticut is about 1.6, I believe that that's the correct number of a municipal's budget. And so librarians have been used to for decades having to stretch every penny in order to provide services and the resources that they do. When you think about the fact that a public library is probably the busiest um, municipal office in your town, and you think about the fact that they receive 1.6% of that municipality's budget, uh, it is astounding what librarians are able to do with that cost. And then when you further break that down, as we see with these costs with eBooks is, thinking about the fact that that has increased so significantly because of the pandemic. And what we've seen is even as people have returned to their public libraries, they have not reduced their access to e-materials. And so libraries are continuing to have to spend significantly higher costs for materials that are being requested even more than, um, than they had been before. It's somewhere between 17 and 25% is usually what a public library's uh, collection is going to electronic materials at this point. And so when you think about calculating that out versus the exponentially higher costs that libraries are paying for those resources, it is absolutely cutting into uh, the taxpayer dollars that are going to support that library. If you think about, even if library was able to, to pay for an e-material that was the same cost as a private consumer, how many more materials they could buy with those same funds? Or they wouldn't have to make the hard decision of, well, I can have a program on this. I can buy, I can hire a new staff member instead of having to pay these significantly higher costs. Uh, because what we have also seen throughout the pandemic is the personal connections that are so important. And that is part of what public libraries and other all libraries are providing is the personal connection between members of the community, a place where people can go, can congregate, can have conversations. Uh, and you think about what they could do with those dollars as well is, um, is phenomenal. One of the points that I got from the uh, Library Association is 
one such book by Stephen King, Fairy Tale, that just came out. Our library systems uh, consortium pays seventeen dollars and eighty-eight cents, and in their ebook, which lasts for twenty-four months, it would cost sixty-seven dollars and ninety-nine cents. Has there been any uh, approach by the publishing company to narrow that differential discrepancy? Have they reached out to work with you, understanding that this this cost? discrepancy, this wide range is is shocking to me. Um, have they reached out and said, how can we be a, a collaborative body with you? No, we have not seen an offer for collaboration. We are offered the terms and we either accept them or we do not. That is the only position we are placed in. We would be very happy to talk about- Well, thank you me. very much. I think one thing that I, I would want to point out to-, to Thank you very much that, for your leadership, uh, Ms. Shander. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you, Senator. Thank you so much. Representative Delnicki, I believe you're next. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. So we're not the only state that has this problem. What states have actually addressed the problem and have they succeeded in whatever legal pitfalls may have occurred? So far, um, this is being approached nationwide. Hawaii most recently um, has a bill that is active right now. Probably the one that you might be most familiar with is bills coming out of Maryland and New York um, uh, from two legislative sessions ago. They were very enthusiastically supported in their legislatures. Uh, the Maryland bill was unfortunately challenged in court and was struck down. The New York bill was vetoed by the governor. Um, and part of the reason that we saw that is the argument, both of those bills said something. They said publishers must sell to libraries under certain terms. And so publishers have said, this is a matter of copyright law, federal preemption, we have the right to say this. Um, but there are other aspects of copyright law, such as for sale doctrine, that these licenses are allowing publishers to get around and have been for many years. Uh, so the version of the bill that we have here, H HB 6800, uh, it doesn't say you must sell. It says if you sell, here are the terms that we consider reasonable in Connecticut. We've seen some other states taking this approach. Some are doing different avenues. Um, and I think that the early response to it was... Um, they were able to kind of say, mm, if you're requiring it, then that's immediately uh, an issue of preemption. Uh, and so states are thinking, but that's not the only thing that's happening. And in this case, because they are licenses and contracts, that is a matter of state law and the states do have the right to do that. Uh, so we have Hawaii, we have, uh, I believe, uh, Massachusetts is um, a current bill. Uh, it is happening in quite a number of states. I don't have the current list off the top of my head, but I would be happy to provide that. It is, um, the issue has not come, gone away in any way because of those challenges. So just to be clear here, Massachusetts actually has a, a law? They don't have a law. They have an, a bill in okay. the active session. Okay. And, and it has not stood legal challenge yet? It has not yet. <laughs> So we would be groundbreaking if we were to actually get something passed we would. and have it stand legal challenge. We would. Well, it certainly is something worthy of an attempt to try to make it right. Absolutely. Because I've got to tell you, when you talk about the cost versus a real hardcover book that literally can be loaned out for a number of years, it's just astronomical. Yes. I appreciate your testimony and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'm just going to confirm we have no one left in the Zoom room with questions. Uh, that is it. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Up next, we have Loretta J. followed by Peter Ramp. I'm going to go with Ramp. Probably not right. <laughs> and I urge you to support Ray's Bill 1140, inclusive of Section 3. 
submitted by the Secretary of State's office that establishes a working group to examine and make recommendations about justices of the peace. The Justice of the Peace Association is the professional membership association for civil marriage officiants. We were established 22 years ago in 2001. And in addition to connecting couples with JPs, we also set professional standards, provide representation, networking, and training. For instance, we have a robust um, professional development for our membership, and we have a free training hub for that is accessed nationwide that has training on everything from human trafficking, child marriage, and working with the deaf, COVID, and more. In response to numerous complaints from current and former Connecticut JPs and town clerks, in 2022, JPS performed extensive research about the way JPs are appointed. We um, invited a comprehensive list of stakeholders to participate, and our key findings were that there's systemic unfairness in the appointment process, there's favoritism, there's inequality between political parties, there's lack of portability between towns. Basically, appointments have become political, even though performing, performing marriages is not. There's also disparity between municipalities. There's three different rules that are used to determine how many JP slots are available in each town. For example, a small town of Easton with less than 8,000 people has 1,733 JP slots, and Danbury with 87,000 has only 45. Um, there's no training requirements for JPs. This creates opportunity for nonfeasance, jeopardizing the legality of marriages and quality of services to the public. Trained JPs are partners to recognize forced marriage and human trafficking and marriage fraud. They are another partner to protect our most vulnerable. A link to our white paper is available um, with our within my written testimony, so please access that if you'd like. Um, while the JPS's white paper outlines specific recommendations to address these problems, we endorse the Secretary of State's office's proposal to establish a work group to study and analyze these issues related to JPs. This will allow all stakeholders to work collaboratively to develop a cohesive plan for sustainable system-wide solutions. Therefore, I respectfully ask you to adopt the Section 3 as proposed by the Secretary of State's office and vote yes in favor of 1140. Thank you for this opportunity to contribute to the discussion. I welcome your questions and I am available to partner to develop solutions. Thank you so much for your testimony. And as a uh, fellow justice of the peace, <laughs> I actually was not aware of the association, which I think sort of proves the point here, doesn't it? <laughs> so um, thank you so much for uh, bringing that up and, and for testifying today. Do we have any questions? I don't see any at this time, but thank you. And I may be following up with you after the fact. Okay. Thanks thank so you much. very much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Uh, next up, we have Peter Ramp, followed by Maria Weingarten. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman. I appreciate this opportunity, and a good afternoon also to all to the members of your committee. Before we get going, number one is, uh, even though I it's not on my list, I second the desire by the library uh, for the e-books, et cetera. And I am also a uh, justice of the peace, and I did not know um, that there was an association. So I have learned a lot. Uh, I'll just go on and just simply say that I am re I'm here today to testify uh, with, with respect to SB 985, as well as SB 1411. With respect to SB uh, 985, I would like to ask you to consider to extend the timeline in that in the as the bill now calls for an extremely short time, and that is insufficient for people to be able to react to it and get their act together. The other one is I ask I would ask you to re remove or clarify promote residential diversity on line 110. Um, it, it needs some clarification as to what we really mean by uh, residential diversity. With respect to that, you've heard this before this morning, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Planning and Zoning Committee needs to be involved in this and not the ZBA. The ZBA is simply there to make sure that uh, the laws are being followed and if there's an appeal, but the planning and zoning is really the main uh, um, member of this. So I'm gonna ask you really to take a look at it from that perspective, 
ZBAs, in fact, don't even meet frequently. They meet every so often. They don't have anybody on their staff or on the, on the groups that is uh, that knows anything about planning and zoning the execution thereof. And uh, so the other thing also is the last one I wanted to add on to it is, is also that other commissions need to be involved in this effort. And it can't be uh, just one commission only. They need to get input uh, from environmental, from uh, from environmental people, from uh, well, let's leave it at mostly at that because I'm trying not trying. I want to get to the second bill. Uh, if you have any questions on that one, I'll, on the first one, I'll I'll answer that uh, as we go along. If we take a look at fourteen eleven, I think I'm going to ask you really to vote no against on that one. It's, it should not come out of committee at all. There's a couple of reasons for it is, uh, number one really is, is I think that's a, more of an incentive for, for, for builders to go into a housing building rush than really is to do the right thing. The properties also that is not in there is all the properties need to have water and sewer access. And in in, in the and I am from Wilton. I should have said that in the beginning. Your time and, is um, late. Excuse me. Am I going to? Am I? Oh, am I done? Please finish your remarks. Yes. Yeah, so if you could just wrap up with a couple more. Oh seconds sure. Okay. Uh, uh, sewer access. Uh, the the other one is the on site uh, parking restrictions. Uh, that needs to be fixed and also, and really is even when you take a look at it, only a very small percentage. 10% of the housing is going to be considered affordable and that ratio needs to be increased. And I'll leave, I'll leave it at that. The rest is in my testimony that I've uh, submitted. Thank you very much. I appreciate no the questions. opportunity. Seeing no questions at this time, thank you for being with us and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Up next, we have Maria Weingarten followed by Eric George. Ms. Weingarten. Thank you so much. Co-chairs Cavaras de Gras and Raman, ranking members Zulo, Fazio, and members of the Planning and Development Committee. My name is Maria Weingarten. I'm a realtor, a former auditor with PwC, and I currently serve as a member of New Canaan's Board of Finance. I'm here as an individual citizen and founder of CT169 Strong to speak in opposition to SB1141 and SB985. Um, I know there have been a number of comments already very specific to the bills that's included within my testimony, so I'm just going to give some more overall commentary. Um, these bills are just gift to lobbyist developers who have an outsized voice in this legislative process. They fund a lot of the housing advocacy groups that are, are, are you know, uh, pushing these bills, and I think that that's problematic because it's really usurping the proper role of those who protect our land locally, and I think it's very important that they, they are engaged. These bills are not about creating an affordability because there's not enough affordability in the bills. We need to honestly recognize that we have 3,000 homeless right now, while these housing advocates are saying that we need 140,000 units built. Um, and, and the housing costs challenged are living somewhere right now. We should be helping them. We shouldn't be overburdening municipalities with unfunded mandates. If we had a better economics environment, it would be much easier to get building happening organically, but we don't because we've been stagnant. Our affordability problem is different from the rest of the country. We're experiencing a death by a thousand taxes and user fees. Connecticut is the second highest tax state in the country and dead last in funding coming back to us from the federal government. US News found that our overall affordability, we ranked 46th, while our housing affordability ranked 19th, much better. We are let, so we need to make sure that Connecticut does better and, and we need to make sure that our legislators and are coordinating at the state and federal level to have a better strategic plan. Our affordability problem is complex even within our state and we have 169 unique city, suburbs and rural communities. According to Fannie Mae, Bridgeport Stanford market is considered a mature market while New Haven and Hartford are lagging markets. In fact, Hartford was rated the best value market this year in the entire country. This is not indicative of high demand for housing stock. Um, these one size fits all bills are therefore the wrong approach, especially the ones that are mandated. We are lagging because of our business unfriendly environment. Poverty has risen in our state due to a lack of good paying jobs 
our population has been stagnant and even still our housing stock has increased more than our population. Development it thrives in those states with better economic policies, yet Connecticut legislators want to break zoning and blame it on that instead of addressing the poor public policies that have gotten us here. It's time to do the harder work and focus on what's right for our residents, not institutions and developer special interests. These bills have passed will escalate local property taxes, destroy commerce and retail around downtowns, exacerbate highway traffic, adversely impact the environment, and offer very little in the way of affordability. It has been stated over and over that there needs to be a significant need for affordability in Connecticut, yet these bills are just going to be increasing a massive number of market rate rental units on the backs of mandating affordable ones. These bills do nothing to help. Um, why, why, why are we not speaking more to stakeholders? Excuse me, your time is complete. Okay, if I could just finish, I have just a two more minute, more sentences to go here. Um, we're not speaking enough to stakeholders, the, the actual people. There are people who testified over three years on the exact issues that have to be fixed in these bills. I'm happy to discuss those. And my greatest concern is that this the governor's bill that's allegedly a carrot because it's an opt-in has still a lot of really onerous sticks in it. And the issue is that, you know, next year when a lot of people don't opt in because of those sticks, it'll be like, well, you know, we gave you these great carrots and you didn't take them. So now we're just going to mandate something onerous. And I hope that you don't go down that path. And I encourage you instead to work with local stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Seeing, oops, Senator Fazio. Uh, thank you, Ms. Weingarten, for your testimony and um, and and your advocacy. Uh, so it was mentioned earlier, Connecticut's um, commission on uh, its development and future um, is trying to inform the state government of of policies it should enact um, in, in order to improve the housing stock. And I think you know, you know when we talk around this circle uh, in this committee, we want to obviously increase the housing stock and provide more affordability. Um, but obviously the commission is been deputized to do a lot of the thinking. Um, do, do you have any, you know, sort of reaction to some of the reports that have been published by them so far, um, or maybe, you know, uh, how the commission's been constituted uh, to date, um, obviously given the responsibilities that have been <laughs> invested in that commission? Yes, actually, I do. Um, you know, I, I heard uh, the question that was posed to Alexis, and she is on one of those committees. Um, and 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 I've I've talked to people on both sides of the aisle, if you will, Democrats and Republicans on there. And in in all honesty, what I'm hearing a lot of is that there's this preordained outcome that's expected to come out of these groups, and they're heavily stacked with housing advocacy group members. They're heavily stacked with one specific opinion that's almost meant to seems to be have a preordained outcome. So so I think there needs to be a more open and inclusive process, one that really engages. You know, we we have tons of testimony. I look back at at, the, at Bill 1141, which was the DSEG bill last year, and there was tons of testimony on there from excellent planning and zoning chairs in different parts of the state who can really talk about why certain things are good or bad about these pieces of legislation, things about as of right mandates and, and limiting parking and the onerous units per acre with, with wording like minimum overall average gross density, which means it's going to be a housing rush where, you know, you might say it looks like 15 units an acre, but the first builder in can build as much and as dense as possible as that area can sustain. Now, that's not that's not embracing your local municipalities at all. And I think that that's where we're going in the wrong direction here. And, and, and one point that Alexis made about, you know, let towns who want to build affordable, who have challenge because the market is more expensive, land is more expensive, development's more expensive, help them. We tend to give money to the largest cities and they're the ones who have all the affordable and it's concentrated poverty there. Help the cities, help the suburbs elsewhere that, that want to do more and are being are challenged because of this. And, and I think you might get a lot further than just creating these onerous sticks that keep coming out in these bills over and over again. And I also would have to say that I find it very concerning that a lot of these things are not even disclosed. 
You know, where, where are the news articles talking about what a minimum overall average gross density is? How many legislators have, have sent a message to, to their constituents to let them know about these onerous bills? I, I would say very few. So, I, you know, I encourage everybody to get informed. And I think that everybody should be doing a better job of working together and collaborating because I think at the end of the day, we all want the good outcomes and we have to stop being so divisive and, and com combative against you know, cities versus suburbs and, and, and different parts of the state. Well, I'm always impressed by the knowledge on the ground of, of local zoning officials. And whenever I you know, get to talk to them or meet them, you know, I, I do try to proactively ask, what would you do if you were in my position or the position of my colleagues in trying to effectuate policy that you know, both respects the local input of neighborhoods, but, but also creates housing? And so it's deeply concerning that if any commission that is uh, invested in uh, with the responsibilities of, of, of trying to achieve those ends on a state level, uh, that we don't have that sort of on the ground knowledge that also understands that we need to balance uh, the interests of neighborhoods and communities with the desire for more housing stock. So um, Ms. Weingarten, I, again, appreciate your testimony um, and, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Wong. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and welcome, Ms. Weingarten. Thank you for your passionate advocacy on a local level and also on, on the state level as well. So thank you. I, I wanted to ask you, in your testimony, I, I had a chance to read it, you talk about Look, be clear, we agree there is a critical need for affordable, diverse, and accessible housing in every parts of our state, rural, suburban, and urban. With that being said, the focus has always been about these bills of affordable housing. And your testimony, written testimony, articulates that this increase in density does nothing to address the affordable, accessible, and diverse housing that's necessary. Can you articulate that a little bit more? Absolutely. So, you know, when you look at each of these bills, because I've, I've actually started to put together a matrix to kind of, because it gets confusing. <laughs> Who wants 15 units in an average, minimum average overall density and all these other terminology? So I try to kind of keep it all straight in my head. And, and the issue really becomes that the, the part that's re re required to be affordable is only like 10%. And it's only if you, you build over, let's say, 10 units, does that 10% rule kick in. That takes all of these towns that might be trying to get toward a moratorium further away or trying to get toward a 10% further away. So what you end up with is high density market value, and, and, and that's not affordable. And again, you know, it's interesting because growing together um, was was I guess which one I guess that's through Open Communities Alliance. They did a survey, and and really they talked about the want for single family housing. And and you know I, I'm not claiming that I have the answer for Fairfield County because it is very it's very expensive, and and it's challenging. But there are parts of our state there very affordable, much more affordable, relatively speaking. And, and there are opportunities that we, we need to find ways to bring business back. I read that Groton is going to be having a once in a generation increase in, in uh, coming to our state and looking and with 5,000 jobs, I believe. You know, that's a great opportunity to build in, in that area, potentially. Again, I'm not an expert on Groton, but but I would say if there's opportunities to give those who are local in the local municipal in the Groton area to develop, that that to me seems like the, the way to work collaboratively together and 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 try to find ways to create affordability within that. So so that's that's really the issue is that these are all mostly market value rental units and the limited affordable that they have sunsets in 40 years seems like a long time, but eventually those units go away. So going back to my original point as well, is in communities that are expensive, why not help them build 100% affordable? Because those will stay affordable forever. And I think that those are two good solutions. And the other one is really to look at the voucher system. And, and I think many times, it doesn't matter what committee you're in, I think the focus needs to be on people, not on protecting institutions or, or structures. 
And, and so I think that that, that, that should be the, the, the overlying, you know, the, the overall focus. And I think that, that that would go a long way to make things better in our state. You cite Groton and obviously saying that you're not an expert in Groton, but uh, you are uh, in New Canaan. And obviously New Canaan has, has been furnished in, in, in the media for struggling to be able to meet the goals and needs. But also counting on your expertise as a realtor, what are the challenges from a standpoint of land cost that is prohibitively different than any other parts of the country that struggle with, with affordable housing opportunities and the ability to build uh, housing? What is land cost and the economics of, of uh, down in southwestern Connecticut that contrasts other parts of the state? Uh, well, it, in, in the Fannie Mae study, again, it, it talked about how the Fairfield County, um, Stanford and Bridgeport metro area are more expensive. And, and, and again, they, they are impacted by the metro New York market. So, so we have, you know, we're, we're comp you know, many of these bills, transit bills talk about the commuting and, and the fact that we don't want people to commute 20 or 30 minutes. Well, newsflash, those people who live in Fairfield County still this day, even post COVID, uh, my husband travels two hours round trip of daily to go to work in, in Manhattan. So, so there are, commuting, you know, there's commuters and that tends to raise the, the market value of homes. It raises the market value of, of you know, any, anything, uh, even, you know, the, the cost of goods is, is more expensive here than even in, in, in cities nearby, depending on which town you're in. So it, it, those are the factors that we have to overcome. And, and on top of that, then I think what, what ends up happening is when, when towns like New Canaan try to build affordable, there are monies that don't necessarily become come available to us. We tried to develop a 100% affordable project and in 2018, Lamont took away our funding. So, you know, we took us another year to, to get to the point where we were able to, you know, get the project off the ground with some federal funding sources. And, and so there are people out there, I guess is my point, who are earnestly trying to do good and to create more affordable. And I think until we recognize and, and help and become an ally to those, those towns who are trying to do that, it's going to be very challenging to, to move forward as quickly as, as, as the, everybody up in, in Hartford might like it, like it to happen. Now, the struggle is, as you just articulated, is, is very much real in New Canaan and towns in southwestern Connecticut. But the other crux of the argument has always been about developers. The developers are, are bad actors on this. Um, can you tell me, and, and, and I, through research, realized that there are different type of developers. Can you contrast, from your experience in New Canaan, a developer like Mr. Hobbs, Hobbs uh, Construction? versus what Avalon has a developer did and the impact it has on the community. So not all developers are equal and not all of them uh, are able to facilitate the goals of affordable and accessible diverse housing. Right, well, I, I, I'm happy to speak about Scott Hobbs who is on our affordable housing committee and has worked volunteer um, through and through for, for well over a decade to help us create affordable in New Canaan. And we recently, um, you know, we, we recently came on with a hundred brand new units and, and, and what we used was, was town owned land. And we are, you know, we, we constantly are trying to move forward and find new places where we can, we can continue because we had one moratorium. We were supposed to be in our second moratorium. And I know this isn't the committee of cognizance on this, but there's, there are, there is some shady business that went down with that um, because we should be in our second moratorium right now. And, um, and we should be actually technically well on our way to our third moratorium. So um, the, these are all issues that, that should be addressed, um, that should be taken care of, that we should be working you know, with an equal playing field and, and, and not be moving goalposts uh, after the fact. Is, and I'll, I'll go there. And I don't really want to talk about uh, other developers who may not be as... Uh, um, well-intentioned, or, you know, I, I guess I, I shouldn't even say that. I'll, I'll just say that, you know, I, I'm very grateful for everything that Scott Hobbs does for our community. And there are plenty of people who volunteer countless hours and time to, to help for the greater good of, of not only for New Canaan, but for the entire state by creating affordable and cre increasing availability. 
Thank you, Ms. Weingarten, and uh, thank you for the indulgence of the chair for the time and questions. Yes, the chair is day. less indulgent by the minute. Uh, Senator Rahman. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Weingarten, uh, for your testimony today. I have a quick question. I know you mentioned uh, you don't want to see that device. It. Uh, as we all know, uh, we are really behind nationwide for affordable housing in the state of Connecticut. I have a 10 years old daughter. 10 years from now, she maybe will leave her own. And I do know she can live in New Canaan to afford the one bedroom or two bedroom apartment as a student at uh, that time. So how you look uh, East Hartford and New Canaan affordable housing? How do I compare New Canaan to, to Hartford? Yes. For affordable housing? Yes. Well, I, I what I would say is that, in, you know, Hartford receives a, a great deal of funding for affordable housing. That's that's the comparison, right? So Hartford is is given, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, I would imagine. I, I, we, we have requested that information to get an understanding of those, those 31 towns, or maybe now they're down to 21 municipalities who have a 30 G 10%. And, and I, and, and the question to me is how much of that was funded out of the state coffers taxpayer dollars. So, you know, we, we, it, this at Fairfield County, obviously, you know, it's just sort of the dynamic of it, right? We, we give a great deal of tax money to the state. We get very little back, understood. Um, and but that money goes to develop the affordable. You know, they, from those coffers go the money to develop affordable in Hartford. So it, what, what we're saying is, if you want to see more affordable developed elsewhere, help other places do it. Hartford also gets a lot of vouchers that help bridge that gap for housing affordability for those who are most challenged. So, you know, those vouchers don't come available to New Canaan. So it, it, it's, it's a different way of, of, of considering it. And, you know, when, when I finished school, I, I couldn't afford New Canaan. I couldn't afford New Canaan when I got my first job. So, you know, we, I had three, I had two other roommates and, and I lived in a walk up in, in, in not the best neighborhood in New York city to, to, to go to my job. So, so that's, you know, you make choices. Everyone makes economic choices and I can't live on the water in old Greenwich either, you know? So, so everybody's got, you know, their form of the American dream. You know, my, my father escaped communism from Hungary with the shirt on his back. He had a blue collar job his entire life. And I think we need to remember that everyone is is has their own different perspective on what the American dream is. And that doesn't mean necessarily living in New Canaan or Norwalk or wherever you might want to live or Vernon or whatever a town town. But I do believe that for many that afford that that American dream is about home ownership. It's not about multifamily rental income in high density developments. So I, I think, you know, we, we need to be careful because these bills are very narrowly focused on creating just that. So I get, I, I get it. Uh, you're saying that the voucher uh, available for Hartford, but there is the builder ready to build affordable housing in a new canon or across the state as we are behind uh, affordable housing. Is affordable housing need our senior? Affordable housing need our youth? Affordable housing need our workforce? So, so many way we need to help, but I uh, get it. There is the a voucher in Hartford or East Hartford, but there is the builder to build, you know, upscale uh, affordable housing. So seems like you have a problem with also anywhere they can build, am I right? Well, you know, I am a member of the Board of Finance and I've recused myself from, from um, I, we are also part of the water pollution control. So I, I will not be discussing that specific project. I will speak more generally and say that um, I think, you know, you, you'll have developers come in and override things. It's, it's, it's a different perspective when it's a town deciding what makes most sense. And I think that they have the most thoughtful perspective on how to, um, how, how to, how to manage a project well, how to, how to properly place it in, in, a, in, you know, close to transit and, and different things like that. So I think that that's the optimal solution. A, using A30G as a cudgel to me is not optimal for any community. Um, and so that's that's where I would stand on that that uh, discussion. I so want, I, yes. I just want to add it. Uh, 
we all know one of the uh, reason, not only reason, GE left from the Fairfield in the Boston because the uh, transit, you know, issue. So it's not just uh, affordable housing, just for the affordable housing. It's also issue for the workforce. Am I right? This is why we lost a uh, huge income and law, you know, they moved out from Connecticut. Well, if we're talking about transit, then we need to talk about the fact that that I think Connecticut's behind the eight ball when it comes to transit as well. When you look at the, I think it's called Intermix study, it showed that four of the 10 uh, worst roads in the entire country for traffic are northbound, southbound on I-95 in Fairfield County and northbound, southbound on, on the Merritt Parkway in Fairfield County. And what a lot of these bills will do is create high density development in these very communities. It seems like that's where that we're, you know, this this county in particular is in the crosshairs. So that that seems to be a real concern because, you know, that what can be done about I-95 without spending millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to, to fix that. And 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 it's it's a parking lot, you know, every day. And 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 you know, and I guess you also have to consider uh, that, um, you know, GE left. Yes, it did. But, um, you know, wh where are people, if, if we're going to be creating an environment where infrastructure is going to be impacted, right? So you're going to have mass overdevelopment of market value rental units. Um, it's not going to equal the infrastructure impacts, impacts to school construction, impacts to sewer capacity, all of these things. These bills don't consider any of that prior to just sort of jamming it down everybody. It, and, and, and so those unfunded mandates on towns are, are gonna be registered in their local property taxes. So when you impact local, local property taxes, so at some point, you know, people who can move will move. And we've seen out migration based on some, some onerous public policy that's been coming down for a number of years now. So, so if you want to make things affordable, you need to start addressing how, you know, the only sustainable way to improve affordability in the state is truly to bring more jobs and more opportunity to the state. And that doesn't start by making really onerous business, you know, that rules that, that are causing a lot of small businesses even to leave our state because, you know, in other, other states where a bill is only on businesses of X number, we tend to bring it down to the, to the lowest denominator and, and make it onerous for, for small business owners. And I think that we have to start looking at ourselves and recognize that that what is it that we're doing that's preventing the growth that you see in places like Tennessee or in, in other states where where development is happening. And, and, and again, I assure you, if things were in a better way, you know, the build it and you will come is not really the right idea here. You, you really need to start from how do we encourage more people to start more businesses and, and, and to come to our state. It's a beautiful state. It's a unique state. And the last thing we want to do is ruining it by one size fits all plan, you know, policies that are just going to turn us all into the same exact cookie cutter. And, and that's what these policies do. So. I understand what exactly you're telling, but uh, say my grandma, she live big home, but she can't afford or can manage the property now. She sold and she want to stay in town. She can't afford to live two bedroom. She can pay the new Canada or Greenwich or Glastonbury $3,200 two bedroom apartment, am I right, or house. So instead of not saying to build, you know, in your backyard, they're saying give the place where we can build affordable housing. Doesn't matter where 169 city anywhere. My daughter can afford. Your grandmother can afford. Workforce can afford. This is what we, you know, looking for. Thank you so very much for your uh, testimonial today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Seeing no other questions at this time, I would just clarify uh, the membership of the CCDF actually is comprised of many uh, House and uh, Senate members from various committees, including planning and development, housing. Um, we also have very specifically, I, I know it was mentioned that it was primarily advocates, but we have members who have expertise in community development, uh, someone who has expertise in state affordable housing, someone who represents a town with a population greater than 30,000. It is not just affordable housing advocates. And I think it's dismissive of the CCDF's work 
to suggest so. Thank you so much for your testimony. Well, let me, let me just respond to that real quickly because I, I would like to say that, you know, I've heard from Democrats on there as well that they feel uncomfortable saying and standing up against it because then they're not going to be considered on future committees. So well, I, I know that they will come forward and share that with me and share that with other leaders on the committee because that is unfortunate if they feel that way. Um, they need to come forward and say that because that is not something that I think is the intention of that commission. So I thank you so much for your testimony and have a wonderful weekend. You too. Up next, we have Eric George followed by Douglas Lord. Thank you. Mr. George, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Representative Kavros de Graw, Senator Rahman, Senator Fazio, members of the Planning and Development Committee. My name is Eric George, and I'm the president of the Insurance Association of Connecticut. And I'm here today to offer testimony in opposition to Senate Bill 1135. Um, the bill would allow municipalities to eliminate bonding requirements for local public construction costs, costing between $100,000 and $5 million. And this would eliminate longstanding protections for Connecticut infrastructure projects. We are concerned about the harm, the potential harm to workers, small business subcontractors, and suppliers. It also could have ramifications to state and local governments as well. I think this committee is well aware of what surety bonds are. But just to make sure, it is a three-party contract where you have the government in the place as the project owner, the obligee. You have the contractor performing the obligation, that is the principal. And then you have the surety, sometimes called the obligor, and it's usually an insurance company. In the case of a public construction project, the surety is going to cover the losses incurred by the obligee if the principal defaults. And this is longstanding um, work that has been done in Connecticut. One example of these types of bonds are performance bonds where they protect the taxpayers by guaranteeing projects will be completed if the contractor fails to perform. One thing that a surety, so in most instances, again, the insurance company, does to vet potential um, contract contractors is conduct extensive pre-qualification examinations and processes. So with the threshold that is envisioned under Senate Bill 1135 of $5 million, that would put Connecticut at the highest amongst the country in terms of um, municipalities that are able to waive uh, those performance bond obligations um, for, those, for those projects. Basically, what I want to also leave you with is information that we have seen from a 2022 Ernst & Young report that actually points to the fact that unbonded projects tend to be much more expensive than bonded projects. And if a unbonded project is goes in default, it takes a much longer time for that project to then get completed because most municipalities, as opposed to sureties, are not in the practice of dealing with defaults and then picking up the pieces where they were left. So you're gonna hear from a couple of other testifiers today. You've, we were moving out a clip, but I, I know that I wanted to make sure that I was um, direct and, and, uh, and, and point and, and in my comments. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Fazio. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. George, for your testimony. Uh, I know we spoke yesterday, and uh, you know I appreciate your input. Uh, you know whether you're in favor or against the bill. You know, for context for the public, the bill idea was brought to me by some municipal officials whom I represent. Um, there are larger towns and cities that uh, two of which that I represent um, that are relatively sophisticated and have relatively large budgets, but also obviously in the interest of property tax payers um, want to limit costs. And on smaller projects, the view is that they could essentially self-insure um, if non-performance happens and finish the project rather than uh, on every single project impose uh, added fees and costs. Um, I can totally imagine that uh, if this policy were to pass that most projects, uh, even below the threshold in the in the towns that I represent to say nothing of of other towns and cities would um, would would go forward with um, with these types of bonds on the project, uh, this type of insurance. Um, th but 
you know, it, it's one of those things that, you know, we're giving optionality to some of the towns and cities. And I also appreciate, you know, n- not every time is the right decision going to be made. We're, we're dealing, we're dealing in broad policy here, but the premise is to give some optionality. You did mention in your, uh, in your testimony that, um, that there's other states with, with similar, uh, with similar uh, types of policies uh, that are that are less uh, strict. If, Go ahead. If, if we were to adopt uh, Senate Bill One One Three Five, Connecticut would be at the top in terms of the threshold. Yeah. Yes, that's what I that's what I understood. But what is a, what is the threshold that other uh, states have um, I put into place? So I know that you have the Surety and Fidelity Association of America coming up in probably I don't know thirteen speakers. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe they will have that information. If not, I can provide you with that information um, after the hearing. One thing, and I, I want to be sensitive to, to what you're saying, because I, I appreciate your um, drive to reduce costs or give optionality, flexibility to towns. Um, this is an analogy that, that um, I think it makes sense. Um, when you have the so most insurance out there is optional but there are certain instances where it is mandatory and one example is auto insurance and there could be a an individual who is high net worth has a high income and they could you know pay for their car if it's damaged or any ensuing loss that somebody else may incur we don't allow that to happen because in the greater public policy interest it is more important to allow to ha- make sure that people have coverage when they're driving out and coverage for what other people may do. So I think it's it's analogous here where I appreciate, and, and, and it's also been reflected in the current law because the current law allows for flexibility for projects under $100,000. Um, I'm, I'm very sensitive to your position that town should have flexibility to reduce their costs. Um, I would argue that this is not the way to do it. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it is telling that uh, our two municipal organizations of CCM and cost have not uh, come out in support of this bill. They, in, in conversations, they have concerns. And I appreciate your recognition that it is a broad brushed policy where, let's say, the, a good portion of the time that there is no default. But if a unwise decision is made and there is default, that's a risk that I just don't think should be taken. I mean, um, our industry focuses on risk in everything that we do, and some are acceptable and some we advise against, and I advise against this. I, I think that at a certain threshold for towns that car insurance would be a good analogy, um, but at a lower threshold, I don't quite see the analogy. Um, I, an individual might get have to incur hundreds of thousands of dollars of cost in, in the case of an auto accident, tens of thousands, uh, and, and many might not be able to afford that. But if you're giving municipalities the option to um, to opt out of the of the insurance at a lower threshold, um, the assumption would be that uh, they are able to to bear those potential costs, and in doing so, they're able to reduce their cost to doing business along the way uh, in order to reduce the the fiscal burdens on their states uh, on their uh, on their taxpayers. Um, I would be interested in seeing the thresholds of the other t- uh, from the other states because. Uh, again, the, the the premise of the bill is to is to reduce cost, provide flexibility. But obviously, I put a threshold in there because uh, I don't think that beyond a certain point, it's a reasonable um, uh, policy uh, enabling policy. Um, and um, and so I think you know I'm I'm more than open to the conversation. Uh, and uh, but and then just uh, my final point is, uh, Madam Chair, is that you know we talk a lot on this committee and on others about. Uh, needing to dial back all the mandates and the costs that we impose on towns and cities uh, in our state government. Um, but it seems like every single year in this state legislature, we only pile on more uh, and and very uh, infrequently roll them back and give our localities more flexibility and choice and reduce costs. So this is an effort in order to accomplish that goal. Um, so again, I appreciate your testimony. I'll look um, uh, into the numbers, uh, you know, when you're able to provide them or when one of your uh, colleagues is. And Senator Fazio, thank you so much for those comments. Um, after this, the conclusion of my testimony here, mm-hmm. I will uh, speak to the people who are coming up after. There's enough time, hopefully, for them to be able to obtain the information or at least endeavor to. 
And, uh, and if not, it will be provided to you afterwards. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. You. Representative Delnicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, good to see you, Eric. Good to see you, Representative Delnicki. So <clears throat> a performance bond. I'm a city, town, municipality, and I have somebody working for me to build a, build a recreation center, let's say, $6 million recreation center. And the uh, company is not uh, doing too well. And you threaten to pull their performance bond. Does that, in essence, then give that company basically a kick in the you know, what, you know what to actually get the job done? Because my recollection is I pulled a performance bond on a contractor many years ago. And that contractor was like, he couldn't believe it. He, he was begging me not to pull it because he was afraid of not being able to ever get another performance bond and basically came back and fixed the job and made it right. Is it, is it fairly accurate that it's difficult if you fail on a per performance bond to get another one? It would make sense that if you have a track record of defaulting on your contracts with municipalities, it is going to be difficult to get another project awarded to you and to get a and get a surety to provide you a bond. I think that uh, the history of any contractor is taken into significant consideration when determining whether they would be uh, bonded in the future. That is my reasoned analysis of it. Um, so that's my answer. Yeah, and I, I, only, I only recount that because I had to do that actually twice. I had to do it on a, a contract for a service and the contractor failed and I pulled the bond. And again, the contractor wanted to in some fashion make it right and get the bond restored. But the, the service was so bad that you know, literally- I have to assume you were arguing that they weren't performing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I can understand the argument or the discussion point of maybe not requiring them at a certain level but I also think you have to bear in mind that it's probably the one tool that you easily have as a municipality, as an entity like that, a town, to be able to get the project done without having to go to court. And is that a fair statement? I mean, it is a, um, it's an option that you have to induce them to perform and, and, and act under their contracted obligations. And I think that uh, any municipality would be incented to use all of the tools at their ability to make sure that a project is done on time and within budget. And, and quite honestly, if I hadn't had to have done that, I don't think I would have known what the power of that tool can be for a municipality, quasi-governmental entity, even the state. And uh, if we are to, to change levels, I think we have to look very carefully at that only from the standpoint that when I needed it, it was a tool that solved a problem, got a project done and eliminated having to go to court. Just, just an observation from, some, from having to pull a performance bond in a contract situation in a municipal environment. Thank you, Mr. George. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam uh, Chair. Thank you so much. Senator Raman. Thank you, Mr. George, for your testimonial question to you. When was the 100,000 uh, originally imposed? So what I would have to do, and I can do this uh, and get you the information today, is I need to go to the statute. And in the statute, it will state when that was done. So I don't have it committed to memory, but I can get you the information today. I think that's fair. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll just follow up on that. So if, um, once we have that information, obviously, um, if the limit had been indexed with a construction price index, do you have any idea of what the limit might be today? I don't, Representative okay. Kavitz Um it is possible that the two speakers, uh, specifically the speaker from the Surety Fidelity Association of America, might have that information. I will alert him to the questions that we received. He might be watching now. 
and I'll uh, hopefully he will be in a position to give you some guidance. And then my follow up to that would be: Would that be a useful piece for us to put into place if yep. um, if if they do have the answer or general answer? That might be something for us to look at as we continue with this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Have a wonderful afternoon. Okay, Douglas Lord, followed by Betsy Guerra. Good afternoon, Mr. Lord. Good afternoon, co-chairs Gavros, Gavros de Gras, Senator Dr. Rahman, Ranking Member Zulo and Fazio, Chairs Chafee and Needleman, and honorable members. I don't know who's online, so I wanted to make sure I got everybody. My name is Doug Lord. I work at the CH Booth Library in Newtown. Um, I'm also president of the Connecticut Library Association. That's a member-driven group of about 800 librarians throughout all of Connecticut, from urban to suburban to rural, all the way from <clears throat> west to east. And on behalf of that entire membership, we wish to uh, uni uniformly express support for raised House Bill 6800. Um, the issue is real. The time is right. Uh, the cost for ebooks and digital media is a runaway train. It has been for many, many years in my library. Uh, one third of my materials budget, that is $52,000, just to contextualize the numbers, is devoted to electronic media. And across the state, that number for public libraries alone is almost $6 million, $5.984 million last year. That's mostly taxpayer funded. And if contracted appropriately, not only would libraries be getting more materials, they would also be getting to keep them for longer. The legislation gives the opportunity to fix that, not only for public libraries, for, but for schools, for colleges and universities and public libraries. Those in opposition to this uh, kind of legislation tend to rely on the federal copyright law as a defense. And this legislation has nothing to do with copyright law. It's strictly contract law focused and it provides Connecticut the opportunity to reel in these markup costs. It will benefit all taxpayers in the state. It's about sustainability. It's about equity. <clears throat> Connecticut does have the oppor opportunity to be the first one in the nation. Uh, as a librarian, we, I provide access to materials in every way that I possibly can to my patrons and eBooks are the single most useful and popular materials uh, that my library stocks and that most public library stock. The pricing structure as it exists right now is absurd. So all we're asking for is the opportunity to negotiate a fair price, just like other contracts that use public funding. Publishers, we're not enemies of publishers. We understand the profit motivation. They're, they're profiting on these library sales because the product that libraries receive is exactly the same as what end consumers receive. And this article in Publishers Weekly uh, Magazine, a trade journal from September of 2022, noted that it was a stellar year for publishers. And in that article, the American Association of Publishers is quoted as stating that overall sales topped 29 billion with a B dollars in 2021, 12% higher than the year prior. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for listening. Thank you for caring. Thank you for your wisdom on this matter. Totally glad to help in any way that I possibly can. Thank you so much for your testimony. Absolutely. Senator Wong. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, welcome, uh, Mr. Lord. You represent an association library. Can you explain that a little bit? Many libraries in Connecticut are municipal. The further west you go, it, those are municipal departments. The first, further west you go in the state, they tend to be more association libraries. Those are 501c3s that are responsible to uh, taxpayers, as most of them receive at least some, if not the majority of their funding from the tax base, the municipal tax base, but also private donors. Um, so I'm also responsible to those folks who come up to me and say, why, why am I 500th on the list? I've given you X amount of dollars this year. What's going on? Of course, we're, we're all about equity. Um, and you know, we've heard testimony and you'll hear more very smart, very motivated librarians talk about this. Um, depending on the platform and the ins and outs, um, we all have uh, each individual community is able to respond to the needs differently. Some can barely afford ebooks at all. Others have more materials money and can thus afford more. But essentially, none of those patrons are getting what they want when they want it. There's different, you know, uh, levels of uh, when a hold threshold will kick in and, you know, the mechanics of it are, uh, they, they vary between libraries. 
So even though it's an association, you you literally function as uh, Newtown's community library. Yes, I am Newtown's public uh, library. You right. work on an interlibrary basis. So in a unique kind of collaboration that is evident in Connecticut, our uh, town libraries, along with our association and, and privately foundation libraries, mm -hmm. you work seamlessly. The consumer gets their books, they can borrow, they can use, but the, the, the funding is a little different. But all of you, even associations, get funding from municipal governments. Yes, that's correct. Which leads to the question I've kind of mentioned before. Um, we're addressing this on a contract law, but the, the cost discrepancy is a, a, a huge, huge cost basis to how you have to operate. And mm -hmm. we talked earlier about, and not to be redundant, the critical services, the essential community contact point that is so important. Your cost going into this cost discrepancy takes away from critical services. This is why you and many of your fellow librarians are, are speaking out loudly as there's a fairness issue when, when the normal marketplace shows numbers and, and a consumer can buy a book at an X cost. Why is there a, a, a such a margin of discrepancy? Because it's taxpayer money. And, and what we're offering through this bill and through leadership by many librarians like yourself is the fact that you're stewards of the part of the community and you see money spent that could be better spent. Absolutely. Librarians are consistently rated at the top of the scale in terms of stewardship of public monies. We're one of the most trusted institutions in the United States of America and in Connecticut, especially. Um, you make wonderful points. And yes, that money that I have to spend on those exorbitantly priced products completely detracts and takes away from the other services and offerings that I could be doing for the benefit of the community. Libraries are generally the hub, the heart of the community. As a state senator representing Newtown, I, I can attest to the fact that your summer reading programs, the initiative that that you engage with students, uh, the offerings that you were able to give during the COVID times and, and the aftermath of people anxious to kind of engage, they're critical. And But I also know the struggles you have financially. Um, your, your friends, uh, great friends of the community, the, one of the best book sales you'll ever mm -hmm. see in all of New England. But you struggle financially every single year asking for municipal budgets. Every single one of our libraries struggle because everybody presumes our libraries will be there tomorrow. Yes. We love our libraries. There's unequivocal, universal love for our libraries. But when it comes to budget time, we always think you can do more with less. Mm -hmm. And if you're in that sphere and you're in that environment, any ability for you to save money to be able to put your resources is a win-win. Um, I'll ask one last question that I've asked um, uh, the state librarian, Ms. Shanter. Um, has the publishers engaged in looking to work with you in regards to understanding your cost basis to reduce their costs? Not to my knowledge. Thank you. Thank you for Absolutely. your community leadership. Thank, Thank you, you for being the president of the Connecticut Library Association. We're very lucky to have you. We Thank appreciate you. the opportunity. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Thank you, Mr. Lord, for your testimony. Thank you, Senator Wong. Up next, we have Betsy Gara, followed by Kate Sheehan, please. Thank you, Representative Cavros de Gras, Senator Rahman, Re Senator Fazio, and Representative Zulo, and members of the committee. My name is Betsy Gara. I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Council of Small Towns. And I'm here today to testify on several bills. However, I have submitted testimony, so I'll reserve my comments to two of those bills with respect to transit-oriented development, cost supports efforts to promote and incentivize and facilitate the uh, development of more affordable, more attainable housing throughout our communities. We do serve on the on Commission on Connecticut's Development and Future and have been an active participant on that commission and on one of the working groups. And we do recognize the value of transit-oriented development. It has been used in our communities in ways to increase their vibrancy, make sure that they're walkable, more livable communities that have a great mix of commercial and residential buildings, um, job accessible housing and retail shops. So TOD in Connecticut has been a tremendous success story. The state has done a great job of working with communities to support transit-oriented development 
uh, that reflect the unique land use characteristics and issues in each community. What we have concerns about, however, is that Senate Bill 1141 is a very rigid top-down approach to transit-oriented development that imposes a very rigid, heavy-handed mandate on municipalities to allow as-of-right housing next to train stations and rapid bus stations without consideration of those unique land use characteristics and without consideration of the other development goals of the community. So we oppose that bill and urge you to do the same. We do appreciate that Senate Bill 985 is taking a very different approach. Under this bill, the towns may uh, identify and designate a housing growth zone in the area that is accessible to trains and bus stations. And then the state would, by providing priority status to projects that include as of right middle housing and streamlining the, the uh, permitting process would provide greater certainty to developers and communities and moving forward with transit oriented development. However, we are concerned that as drafted, the bill may shut out transit oriented development projects that either can't include middle housing or have some other type of housing that they're supportive of or some other kind of development project because of certain existing residential or, or industrial development or because of various land use characteristics. And I don't know that you, you wanna do that. Um, it, you're gonna hear from uh, other local officials this afternoon, uh, including Chris Edge from the town of Berlin, who's done some very successful TOD projects in that area. And there is a concern that by being very prescriptive, you may end up shutting out some of the transit oriented development projects from funding that are gonna end up getting priority under this system. So thank you for the opportunity to comment. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. I am checking the Zoom room to see if we have anybody there, but I'm not up, oh, Senator Wong. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Guerra. Um, Thank you for representing these small towns. And, and I think, and I appreciate your first uh, statement of understanding that uh, transit-oriented designs in the right setting is very welcomed and, and an effective economic initiative. Uh, but you also cited the concerns of the one-size-fits-all uh, dilemma that we counter. And, and, and the has of right uh, is a point of concern. I, I just wanted to cite my appreciations in you representing the very small communities that have unique transit oriented that were developed in and had community settings surrounding it. And that this bill would very much eviscerate those community settings with these has of right development initiatives. So thank you for representing the small towns and representing that uh, some of these initiatives proposed by this bill is a one size fits all that does not fit everyone. So thank you. Thank you for your leadership uh, on behalf of cost. And thank you, Madam thank Chair. You so, thank you so much, Senator. Thank you. Uh, yes, Representative Dubitsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Betsy, for coming in. Um, you know, I, as you know, I represent uh, quite a few very small towns and um, a, a bigger problem than a lack of affordable housing is a lack of transportation in our small towns. Um, just getting to and from the small towns is often a very, you, you need a car. There's no, no, no other way to do it. And my, one of my main concerns with this bill and bills like it is that it would affirmatively discourage towns from seeking additional transportation opportunities for fear that doing so would require them to change their zoning regulations um, in order to reduce the allowable size of uh, housing lots, or you know, it would be essentially by right if a town accepted a, um, a you know, bus station or something like that, some type of public transportation into the town, suddenly there is an area around that that would uh, allow for very intense development um, compared to what else exists in town. Um, have, have you or the people of cost um, 
talked about that at all, how this would essentially actively discourage uh, development and, and, uh, and transportation opportunities throughout the small towns. That is certainly a valid concern that you raise, Representative Dubitsky, and, and you're right. We do need to do more to meet the transportation needs of, of our communities in some of our more rural areas. And you're right. I, I don't know. We've had a formal discussion about that aspect of the bill, but it certainly uh, raises a valid concern that you're going to create a situation where towns may be reluctant to embrace transit uh, options because it does come along with other other mandates. So um, that that is certainly an issue. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your coming in. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Seeing no other questions at this time, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Up next, we have Kate Sheehan and followed by Olivia Scully. Hi, thank you for your time today. Um, I'm here in support of uh, 6800, an act concerning electronic books and digital audiobook licensing. Um, as my colleagues have told you, um, libraries have already purchased, have always purchased materials in a wide variety of formats. Uh, we've purchased books as hardcovers, paperbacks, on tape, on CD, playaways, large print, um, ebooks, and e audiobooks are, at first blush, more of the same. Um, however, they are more than just a new format. When we buy physical materials, we do this as um, at a discount off of retail pricing from a variety of library vendors. With ebooks, we must purchase a platform for circulation and then buy the ebooks from that vendor that makes the platform. Uh, we can then lend them only to those who hold a card in our library, which circumvents the statewide reciprocity that allows Connecticut residents to use libraries throughout the state. Um, and most distressingly, the prices are significantly higher than retail and the books expire. Uh, management of a physical collection is both science and art. Um, print books can be repaired and replacements can be managed based on budget and popularity of a title or subject. Um, ebooks and e audiobooks vanish, as you've heard, on a predetermined schedule and must be repurchased at that same high price uh, to be kept in the collection. There's no way to build a rich, deep collection for our patrons. The cost is higher for a lower value format. Um, as with any technology, ebook and e audiobook pricing has changed over the years. However, unlike any other format or most technologies, uh, the terms have gotten much worse for libraries. Uh, prices have gone up. Publishers have increasingly adopted the expiring ebook for a uh, model that since HarperCollins pioneered that in 2011. Uh, we can buy fewer and fewer ebooks for increasingly long wait lists. Uh, ebook use has grown steadily uh, and it's exploded with the pandemic. Ebooks offer accessibility features like custom fonts or larger print size that are impossible or expensive to replicate in print. Readers who cannot hold a hefty large print volume can wield a lightweight tablet or an e reader and they can get a wider variety of titles. Uh, ebooks are going to continue to be popular and libraries need a sustainable and equitable way to buy them. Um, I've worked uh, throughout Connecticut at different public libraries. My colleagues have always taken their role as uh, stewards of public funds to heart. Uh, we support authors who are not made pay more for these more expensive ebooks and would actually make more money if we could buy more copies. Uh, we want our communities to have access to materials in as many formats as possible. Um, we want ebooks for the retirees who devour a book or two a week and are delighted to use their library's ebook collections. We want them for families who are embarking on road trips and use e audiobooks to quell backseat complaints and bond over favorite stories. Uh, we want them for reluctant readers who use the dyslexia font and read aloud features on tablets to spark a love of the written word. Uh, we need your help uh, to meet the needs of our patrons. The current terms are unfair to libraries, authors, readers, and all Connecticut taxpayers. Please support this bill. Thank you so much for your testimony. So what Thank I'm you. hearing um, in, from your testimony and from others we've heard today is neither the libraries nor the authors are making out on this. It is specifically no. the publishers and the publishers are not coming to the table to offer any other terms of service or contract to this point. Yes, that's exactly true. Um, I've been pursuing this issue for and following this issue for many years. Um, and one of the things I've heard over and over and over again is libraries need to, the phrase you used uh, struck this struck this for me, uh, libraries need to demand a seat at the table. Um, how? <laughs> um, and so this is, uh, this is how, uh, this is this is the uh, solution that I think as, you know, as you've heard, this has been um, different types of legislation have been advanced at, at different states. Um, this is the only way we are left with. We've approached, uh, the ALA, ALA has had multiple committees approaching publishers. Here we are. 
if ALA can't get it done, I'm not, it, it definitely is in our laps. That's for sure. I don't yeah. see any other quite oh, representative Del Nicky has a question. Thank you, Madam chair. Uh, ju just briefly your situation there, you, you can't get a hard copy book per se, or just counter is counter to what you need to do to serve the folks that you serve. And you're really between a rock and a hard place when it comes to to dealing with the cost. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that that is. I mean, ebooks are, um, as I said, they're wildly popular, um, and we have lots of folks who really need that format. Um, and we have um, really no way to acquire a collection that would that meets our patrons' needs at this point. Um, and we can we can get print books. That's not a problem. Um, but it's it's getting these electronic copies that is has been um, we've been in stock. Yeah. You know, it almost strikes me as having it as an electronic medium should be saving you money, as opposed to costing you an exorbitantly higher cost. And and in essence, having the the book after a period of time, the electronic book after a period of time evaporate is that yeah no that's exactly true um and i can tell you i just anecdotally um my parents who are former connecticut residents um they decamped to florida sadly um they um are huge readers and when they retired they basically switched entirely to ebooks because it was cheaper for them um and also they would i the house they need the space <laughs> um um and you know, and and also anecdotally, I mean, the expiring ebooks, um, at least for me, uh, you know, when I I feel a certain measure of guilt when I don't finish any audiobook in time and I have to check it out a second time, I think, oh, I've wasted one of our one of our limited checkouts. Um, you know, it's uh, it's definitely um, it's it's really been we we are a rock and a hard place is exactly the uh, the image. Well, I appreciate your. Uh your answers and your commentary on the uh, on the situation. And I have to wholeheartedly agree with you that we need to try to attempt to do something here to to address this, not just for librarians, but for the taxpayer too, because the taxpayer is actually bearing a huge burden here on higher cost. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I just want to say before I let you go that that last point really struck me about the renewing the books as a parent. How many times have we had to, oh, we need to check that book back out because, you know, my son has a, a chapter to go or two chapters to go or whatever it is. And I think especially about our young adult community, our teen readers, um, yes. because though they are some of the most voracious readers we have, thankfully, you know, if you're reading several at one time, which our teens often are, you do need a, occasionally a, a recheckout. And, and you're right, that does... I don't, I hate to say waste, but it does waste an allocation. So um, thank you so much for your testimony today. Have a very thank nice Thank you so time. much. I really appreciate it. Uh, up next, we have Olivia Scully followed by Bruce McDermott. Welcome, Ms. Scully. Thank you. And good afternoon, Senator Rahman, Representative Cavros de Gras and honorable members of the Planning and Development Committee. Uh, my name is Olivia Scully. I'm a resident of Middletown and a librarian, and I'm testifying in support of House Bill 6800. Most of the library folks that you'll hear from today are directors, administrators, and I fully agree with my colleagues regarding the impact this bill will have on libraries, both to save money and serve the community. I've worked in Connecticut libraries for almost 12 years, and until recently, I was a librarian working directly with the public, boots on the ground. We might have had one or two electronic copies of the latest James Patterson novel for our entire consortium to share with a six month hold list to get through just to make sure everyone could borrow that ebook. And I can't tell you the number of times I heard from patrons just abject frustration with the current state of digital borrowing. And I can completely relate to that frustration because I'm an avid reader. And more than that, for me, ebooks have been a lifeline. I'm autistic. I'm still unpacking what exactly that means for me, but even though I have relatively low support needs, autism affects my everyday life, including something as simple as borrowing a book. 
For me, being autistic means that sometimes it's a huge challenge for me to leave my home to go borrow a physical book because there is just so much involved in that process. The planning involved, the sensory overload, the promise of social interaction. When I can, I love going to the library, but most of the time it is overwhelming just to even think about it. So when I want to borrow a book, my first stop is always to check online and I check the library because it's free and I'm on a budget. Library ebooks give me access to so much information and enjoyment that I just wouldn't have otherwise. But libraries are also on a budget and they can't always afford to pay for the same breadth of ebook titles that they can put on the shelves. If they don't have a title available as an ebook, I usually just give up, even if a hard copy might be on the shelf or available to inter interlibrary loan. And if I do find something that I want, I might have to wait six months before it gets to me. So um, but every now and then I find exactly the title I want. It's available to borrow right now. Uh, I jump on it and it's like striking gold, but normally the limitations of my library's electronic collection mean I can't keep up with the newest releases, the bestsellers, any up to the minute books on current events, or even the latest books written by other adult autistic women that can help me better understand my own experiences. Easily borrowing these titles should not feel like a eureka diamond in the rough moment. And it is frustrating for me that I can't borrow eBooks with the same simplicity and abundance that other patrons have when they're hauling away tote bags full of hardcovers. Having that same level of access would be such a huge benefit for me and for others who face similar kinds of barriers. So I'm asking you to please support HB 6800 and help libraries to provide access to abundant digital collections for patrons like me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scully, for your testimony, and especially for your bravery in telling your personal story, which is not always easy to do. I know that when we go to vote on this bill, uh, I will be thinking of your story um, for a long time to come. So thank you very much for sharing that. I'm thank seeing you. no questions at this time, but that does not mean we weren't listening. <laughs> Have thank a wonderful you. afternoon. Thank you. You too. Up next, Bruce McDermott, followed by Mayor Justin Elliker. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the privilege of uh, addressing you all. Uh, I'm here at the invitation of uh, Representative Baumgartner, and I'd like to uh, talk to you about Bill 1137 having to deal with short-term rentals. But just as a short aside, if I may, I'm talking to you from Florida now. I'm down here in a town called The Land, and we're talking about affordability in Connecticut. And a lot of the people that we have up here uh, in Connecticut are moving to places like Florida because of property taxes. It's a big deal. And the other problem that, that we have in Connecticut that we don't have down here in Florida is jobs. We have a thousand people moving in here every day. And in our particular town here, the land, which is about 20 miles west of Daytona Beach, since I've been here in the winters, which is when we come down from Groton, the population has doubled. As we speak, they're building a couple of thousand houses here in town. So that's what's going on in other parts of the country. We need to address those problems in Connecticut. You don't want to address the politics, but there's some other things that we can do. Uh, let me let me talk about short-term rentals for a moment, if I may. In Groton, uh, I live in Mystic, but uh, Mystic is part of Groton. In Groton, we have a problem with our zoning regulations in that even though we effectively uh, ban short-term rentals. They're not enforced. The uh, regulations are just simply not enforced. The town attorney and the zoning enforcement officers have literally upended the language that's used to support banning these things, and uh, we can't get very far. So I really would like to see the state of Connecticut with 1137 put together some regulations and language which is clear and definitive and uh, tells exactly what short-term rentals are and are not and how they might and might not be regulated. Uh, for those of you who are not impacted by short-term rentals, I can tell you that in Mystic, it, it is becoming a problem. On my street, which is a main street, Route 215, I have six neighbors that I've lost because of these short-term rentals. Um, People pass away, they move out, 
and people want to come in and buy these uh, houses up and turn them into short-term rentals because they can make money immediately. And it eviscerates our neighborhoods. It's a, a real problem and it impacts our quality of life. Um, we certainly have a problem with things like noise. People come in, the, the neighbor next to me has a 3,500 square foot house, which he advertises on VRBO that he can handle uh, 16 guests. And if you can imagine having 16 guests next door to you, uh, then God bless you. We certainly want to do something about Your this. Your three minutes is complete. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Do Is there anybody that would like to ask a question? I, well, we're going to work on that now. Okay. <laughs> Representative Sorry. Baumgartner. Go ahead, please. I've got a few questions. Uh, Bruce, it, it's great to see you. Um, hope Thanks. you can bring some uh, sunshine back up to us um, uh, very soon. I know you'll be doing uh, doing just that um, in the next coming weeks. But um, it's great to hear you and um, appreciate you coming up to um, P&D to testify. Um, as you've highlighted, short-term rentals um, is a very nuanced issue depending on uh, whether you're coming in to visit uh, our wonderful community, or uh, if you live on a street where you're getting a lot of those visitors. Uh, nonetheless, um, when I think about short-term rentals, I think about the impacts on the existing housing stock. Uh, a lot of people don't associate uh, short-term rentals uh, with issues of affordability. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, since the pandemic, a lot of folks have been buying up homes all cash, and as a result, have put uh, significant strains on the uh, price points uh, or um, has made it um, prohibitively uh, expensive for uh, and created barriers of entry into the housing market for uh, people who uh, not only are looking into the area, but people who, are, who already uh, live here in our uh, neighborhoods. Uh, as a result, um, homes that were traditionally used as long-term um, rentals are now being converted to uh, Airbnbs. Therefore, uh, the workforce housing, all the folks who actually uh, work at the restaurants that everyone loves to come and visit, I can't even live in the community where those restaurants are located. And I think that's a huge problem. So I really hope we don't lose sight of that affordability piece when we're talking about short-term rentals, because I think sometimes it's viewed in sort of a NIMBY lens, which couldn't, um, I think couldn't be further from the, the case. So I'd, uh, I was curious if you can kind of speak to some of those uh, concerns, Mr. Sure. Well, General Dynamics, which is uh, our biggest employer in town, electric boat that makes the submarines, they're planning on hiring five, 6,000 people in the next couple of years to build these submarines. And um, frankly, we don't have no idea where they're gonna go. If they're gonna go to Groton or surrounding communities, they, they certainly won't be able to come to uh, uh, Mystic or Groton because uh, we have these short-term rentals, hundreds of them, which have just taken that housing stock out of circulation so that uh, nobody can rent it. And short-term rentals don't rent year round. It's just a portion of the year, but they nevertheless take everything out of our uh, housing stock. So yes, we, we definitely have a problem with that. Um, I don't know uh, where we're gonna put all of the people that would like to rent because it's hard to find any place to rent in Mystic or Groton. Um, in the last, uh, after a, a few weeks now um, serving on this committee, I'm sure if we, asked a pop quiz of some of my fellow committee members, they could give you a definition of a fire district. Um, and um, as you know, um, you, you live in the Mystic Fire District, uh, which uh, by, uh, includes both Groton and Stonington. And um, on the Stonington side of the river in, in Mystic, they too have experienced a lot of issues with short-term rentals. In fact, uh, the Stonington First Luck Woman submitted testimony uh, in support of this bill and in asking uh, the committee to uh, consider um, really clarifying um, our, our state statutes, as you know, um, you know, various town attorneys have um, provided their legal opinions on, um, you know, on this matter and stated that uh, Connecticut or municipalities do not have the statutory authority to regulate renting of uh, residential properties based on the length of stay uh, of the renters. So uh, can you speak to the legal definitions that our town in Groton have used with the 30 days and, um, and, and speak to why it's so important that the state does um, define um, the term uh, short, uh, 
the short-term rental term and 30 days that accompany that definition? Well, the, our, our zoning people are currently trying to figure out what to do about this whole thing. Hired a consultant to help them do that. And they're, they're uh, now considering some regulations which might specify a little bit more clearly what these short-term rentals are and how, how they can be regulated. But short of that happening, we don't know when that's gonna happen. Uh, the state could certainly make things a lot easier for us if they put forth some regulations with regard to what these things are and what a short-term rental actually is. Um, it's, uh, without that information, it's just gonna be difficult to do anything. Thank you. And lastly, um, I would like to ask if you would, uh, if you support the current language and if you would support uh, amending the bill uh, to include some of your suggestions and also um, in terms of the legal protections to the towns and political subdivisions, which would include fire districts, uh, case in point, no ink fire district um, has its own zoning authority and ban right. short-term rentals. Uh, therefore, right. uh, short-term rentals cannot operate uh, legally in knowing, whereas the rest of the town, um, technically because of a lack of regulation or clarity, they can. Um, so uh, again, in, in Sonington and Groton, take two issues, for example, uh, ordinances placing restrictions such as uh, one only allowing short-term rentals as primary residences. And again, the lack of clarity about political subdivisions that currently prohibit short-term rentals having the autonomy slash protection from any town ordinance regulating STRs. Uh, would you support including um, those types of um, amendments uh, to the proposed legislation for short-term rentals, Mr. McDermott? Yes, I certainly would. And uh, one of the key provisions that I think we need is short-term rentals that are owner-occupied are perfectly okay. Those are the kinds of rentals where you have somebody who is going to be your neighbor and continue to be your neighbor and won't take housing stock out of the neighborhood. That's what really this all comes down to is just our quality of life. And it's just becoming a real problem all across the state and across the country for that matter. So I certainly would support any kind of legal provision which would support um, holding the towns harmless should these things become a problem. Uh, thank you, Mr. McDermott. And um, I'll, I'll just conclude by stating next week in Stonington, they'll be voting on ordinance that will regulate short-term rentals. But I would note they um, removed from that draft ordinance uh, last week, the provision uh, that would um, that would allow short-term rentals only for primary residences because of the fear uh, that um, uh, of litigation. There is absolutely no clarity in state law and this really needs to uh, be corrected this legislative session. So uh, thank you, Mr. McDermott for testifying and I appreciate uh, the committee chair for um, perhaps my overindulgence of the question. You're welcome, thank you all. It's good to hear from you, Representative Bumgarner. <laughs> Seeing no other questions at this time. Thank you so much, Mr. McDermott. We appreciate your testimony. Up next, we have Mayor Justin Elliker, followed by Scott Jarzombek. Hope I got that one right. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me on. Uh, thanks uh, to the co-chairs, uh, Carlos de Gras and uh, Raman and the rest of the Planning and Development Committee for your work here. These are long meetings and really appreciate your service to the community. Uh, my name is uh, Justin Elliker. I'm the mayor of New Haven, and I'm here uh, in support of SB 1141. Uh, that focuses on increasing housing opportunities in the state of Connecticut. Vacancy rates are at their lowest uh, pretty much ever. Housing costs continue to dramatically increase in our state, and nearly everyone agrees we meet, need more housing in our state. Residents, business leaders, people interested in moving to our community, and I hope that we also can agree that we want to integrate more, have people from different backgrounds, different walks of life, different economic levels, living together and learning from one another. Um, why is this housing challenge so urgent for us? Well, uh, first of all, there's people that are day to day seeing their salaries not rise at a commensurate rate as their rents and struggling more and more to, uh, to afford where they currently live uh, and not seeing other options on the horizon. And additionally, we need to make ourselves more competitive. Uh, I've heard from many business leaders that it's a struggle to attack, attract good talent because we just do not have enough affordable housing at many different levels and classifications of affordability. 
Uh, cities like mine that I represent, New Haven, are working very, very hard to increase all types of housing. And as many of you know, the city has led the state in overall economic performance and housing growth in the, each of the last three years. SB 1141 is a small but important step forward for increasing opportunities for housing, allows, allowing as of right increased density development around transit centers will help increase the overall housing supply in a reasonable measured way. It's also beneficial for the environment because we will have more people living closely to uh, transit options so that they can opt out of using their cars. Uh, and it's a moderate, uh, a moderate approach, uh, density of only 15 units per acre. Um, in New Haven, we're working very hard, but we can't do this alone. We can't address the state's dramatic housing shortage alone. And we need the support of our suburban counterparts who by and large have been reluctant to support any meaningful increase in housing in their communities. And I appreciate the efforts by some to find ways to incentivize, but the reality is there just hasn't been enough movement uh, by our suburban counterparts to build more housing. Connecticut's towns aren't building new homes. And that's not because of a lack of financing, that is because of a zoning code that is restrictive. Oftentimes concerns are brought up uh, about the impact on smaller towns uh, and the density that they might see, but 15 units per acre, I mean, a football field is 1.32 acres. So 15 units, you imagine that is really not a lot. There's oftentimes concerns related to parking, the focus on transit oriented development in this bill, uh, in my strong opinion, addresses that. There's concerns that the state shouldn't intervene in local control. The reality is the state tells us all the time, what we can and can't do. The state doesn't allow us to install red light cameras in New Haven, which I don't agree with. The state doesn't allow us to implement our own sales and hotel tax. We have a state building code. The very people that often claim that the state shouldn't interfere in local affairs also actively support the state limiting our control in other areas. SB 1141 is a small step forward and I hope that you support this initiative. Thank you so much, Mayor Elker. We appreciate your testimony. Uh, first question for me would be, we've heard a lot of opposing testimony today to this, and especially around the fact that one size does not fit all, that we don't need to be putting in mandates, that uh, this housing needs to happen, it seems, organically. Um, and I guess my question to you would be, is, is that how you think this problem gets solved? Uh, it's not getting solved, and everyone that's testifying in their own towns has the ability to help solve this problem voluntarily, and they're not doing so. So you look at the numbers across the state with many, many suburban towns, and the percentage of affordable units is very, very low. We're not seeing the movement we need to see, and it's just not happening voluntarily. Uh, and so if the communities that uh, were concerned about this actually sh showed a lot of progress, I think that we all would come to the table with a very different opinion here. Okay, thank you. We have a question from uh, Senator, Fa I was say Representative Dubitsky or, okay, Representative Dubitsky first. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Mayor, for coming in. Uh, a year or so ago, we had a similar bill uh, requiring a um, all towns have very dense uh, housing requirements. Um, I think it was approximately 15 units per acre. And you and I had a little colloquy, uh, made some press. And in that discussion, um, you had indicated that the affordable housing in your city and probably by implication in all cities, was costing a lot of money to the cities and was, uh, was very expensive to maintain um, in services and things like that. Um, has that changed since we had that discussion? Yeah, I, so I don't remember exactly uh, what I said, Mr. Dubitsky, uh, but I did not say that affordable housing is costly to maintain. There needs to oftentimes be incentives for affordable housing to ensure that developers are able to reach the gap between uh, their ability to raise funds to actually build the development. But as far as costly to maintain on an operation, operational level, it's like every other unit. Well, I, I meant costly with regard to services and things like that, that the city has to provide and that it's costly to the city. 
And yeah, so you were, you were interested in seeing some of that uh, broadened out into the uh, other into other communities. No, so uh, what I th I think is important, uh, Representative Dubitsky, is that all of Connecticut share in our goal to increase diversity, and that's the diversity of racial uh, and ethnicity. It's also the diversity of people from many different economic levels. And I think that we all play some role in improving that uh, situation right now. And we're not seeing that as much in many communities. And there's a close tie with affordability and the, uh, the diversity that, and disparities and segregation that I think we see in a lot of our communities. Well, I, I know that's the reason why you uh, why you're supporting this, but we got into a little bit more detail last time. I'm not sure we have to do that this time, but you acknowledged that um, that this type of housing was a burden on the city. Um, I believe you even used that very word, burden, and that in addition to sharing in the uh, diversity of uh, economic levels and race and things like that, you were interested in sharing the burden uh, that your city and other cities are currently incurring. Um, so I'm asking you, is has that burden changed in the last year or so? Um, or should the, the towns that would be mandated to increase density um, expect that that burden is going to come to them as well. Uh, I so you, you're welcome to look at my testimony and watch the video, uh, okay. but you're welcome to do it again. Um, but I hardly think that a requirement for 15 units per acre, that as I recall, it's a development maybe over six units, uh, is required to have 10 percent affordable. Uh, and that 10% affordable, I believe, is 80% AMI. I hardly think that's a burden on anyone, Mr. Dubitsky. Well, you understand that there are towns that have four acre zoning, so one unit per four acres. And now this proposal would require 15 acres, I mean, 15 units per acre. In that's a half, in, in a half mile zone or, uh, around a transit center. Sure. Well, a half mile could encompass almost all of the town. In the town that you may be describing, I suspect it doesn't have a transit center, Mr. Dubitsky. And this would actively discourage it getting one. Uh, and I would suspect that there would not be one located in that town because there is so little demand for public transportation because there's just not the density that that is an unrealistic scenario that you're describing. I'm not sure how unrealistic it is. We're, we, we live out here. We understand what's going on. Um, but I thank you for your testimony. And uh, I will, of course, again, go over the testimony that you gave previously. Um, and I'd encourage you to do so, too, because I can assure you that's exactly what you said. Thank you. E either, way, either way, Mr. Dubitsky. And, and uh, you know, I would I would add that a, in my reading of the proposed legislation doesn't include, for example, a public bus stop. It includes a transit center that is train or bus rapid transit, which is very different than a bus stop. And so it does not preclude communities from having access to public transportation, it doesn't disincentivize them, because in my reading of the legislation, what you're describing is uh, as being disincentivized by this would be something that's unlikely to go there, but it doesn't mean that public transportation can't serve your community. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Senator Pazio, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your uh, testimony and, and joining us today. Um, there's another bill before our committee that would uh, that is proposed by Representative O'Day that would provide um, equal funding, um, basically per unit for transit oriented type developments around the state. You had mentioned in your testimony that um, uh, that it is the responsibility of other towns uh, that are not your own to do more 
to construct uh, affordable housing. Um, his bill would get at the funding side of things, not just the regulatory zoning uh, side of things, uh, in order to ensure that uh, we're providing equal support across municipalities to develop that housing, um, rather than you know imposing the sticks with without the carrots. Would you be supportive of of such a proposal that provided uh, equal funding across municipalities per the developments? Are you talking about nine eight five or another bill? I believe it is nine eight five. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm supportive of the concept of right, it, having. It's a different bill. It's a different bill. Um, okay. Uh, Understood. So I'm not familiar with the bill, so I don't want to talk to the specifics of that bill, but I think that it's important to have incentives as well. And, I, and I'm not opposed to incentives. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I get it. But, you know, kind of drilling down into the concepts, you know, there are hundreds of millions of dollars that the state spends over a, a period of time on housing production, on public housing. Um, and, um, you know, the thought is that if you're if you're providing substantially more funding for housing development to one municipality, then um, then penalizing the other municipalities on their lack of production um, would be unreasonable, would be difficult on uh, on them and, and an unfair kind of standard. So, you know, listen, a lot of the municipalities that where the, the officials that I talk to, they're very proud about their public housing developments, about the affordable housing they've done. But they say, listen, if we had more state support, if we had more state funding, uh, like other municipalities get, um, then we would be able to do more. Um, so again, the funding side of things becomes very important in production. So, so that's why I, I think that it's an incomplete conversation to, you know, to, to urge towns or cities that you don't think are doing enough to do more when the state taxpayer isn't there to, to back them. Yeah, I, I just respectfully disagree with that. You know, where, where I grew up in New Canaan, there's 2.94% affordable housing. I think that was not this number from a year ago may have slightly changed. And I find it hard to believe that if New Canaan were proactively working to significantly increase its affordable housing, that the state, similar to the conversations that we very actively have with the state in New Haven, wouldn't come and say, we're willing to help financially support this project because it's meaningfully moving the dial on affordable housing. I think incentives are great, but I don't think incentives are the problem here, sir. Um, well, I appreciate the reference to New Canaan because New Canaan's housing authority and town government has asked for more state funding in order to develop more affordable housing. So if the state was there, I do believe that New Canaan would do be able to do more, construct more, because they are very proud of Canaan Parish and the hundred units that it's put in in recent years. Um, that's why I was able to get a moratorium um, again. And then again, and the two point five percent that's deed restricted in government housing. It's not all affordable housing by virtue of the market rate. Uh, it's it it kind of puts this this strained strange accounting fiction on the towns that doesn't accurately reflect how much is affordable, how much is not affordable, um, and making sure that we count and credit towns and cities for the naturally occurring affordable is also important because it also then enables us to provide the incentive uh, under 830G or other statutes to encourage more of that kind of um, discrete affordable housing, the ADU that's low cost, the apartment one-off that's low cost, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I just, I just, you know, I look at bills like this and I'm like, man, this, this is really demoralizing communities who want determination over how they regulate their towns and developments and zoning. And I don't propose to get rid of all these affordable housing statutes. I could have proposed bills on that and I, others could have too. Um, but we need to find kind of a middle ground that both ensures that we build more, but also protects the local input of communities as well uh, so I, I appreciate so, your testimony yeah i would i would just say that this is a middle ground if anything it is leaning toward uh, towards more of a conservative approach to nudging suburban communities to have more affordable housing 15 units per acre in my view we should be going much further and really really pushing the limit here 15 units per acre is a very, very small change for any town and 10% of that affordable, that's not a significant change. Yeah, I, I just, I respectfully disagree that abrogating zoning effectively uh, up to 
15 units per acre uh, is that. But um, again, I do appreciate your testimony and your input. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the indulgence. Thank you, Senator. That, uh, at this time, there is no other uh, question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for taking time and coming testifying. Thank you. Thank you all. Take care. Is Scott Johnson followed by Donna McGinsey? The distinguished members of the Planning and Development Committee, I am Scott Chazumbeck, the Town Librarian for Fairfield, Connecticut. I am here to testify in support of HB 06800, an act concerning electronic book and digital audiobook licensing. Fairfield Public Library is one of the highest circulating libraries in the state, with a population who adopted ebooks and e audiobooks early and whose demand for this format has only grown since the pandemic. Ebooks are not a luxury. They are simply a matter of access. Ebooks help mitigate barriers to library services. An ebook collection is 24 hours safe and accessible. Schedules, transportation, disability, and avoiding public spaces due to health concerns do not impact digital borrowing. Ebooks are also an excellent format for those who live with visual impairment. Ebook fonts are adjustable and titles are available in audio. Our ebook collections provide an additional tool for reaching underserved people and eliminating, eliminating unintended information related roadblocks. Ebooks have also ebooks have also attracted new users who have who had yet to consider the library services before, creating a whole new tier of patron who is interested in online content but are often confused by the arbitrary constraints put in place in regards to online borrowing. While physical book circulation has decreased, it is not nearly at the same ratio as ebook adoption, nor will ebooks ever replace physical borrowing, not in our lifetimes. It's an addition, not a replacement. We also have to take into consideration a recent development. Many municipalities are now looking towards cuts in book budgets to cover wage pressure, and increasing costs due to inflation. We aren't seeing our book budgets grow, and for some libraries, they are facing significant reductions, all while demand for this format that costs considerably more per item intensifies. It is also important to note that this is not ownership, but licensing fees established under unfair contracts in a market lacking significant competition or pressure. Fairfield is lucky to have the financial support of, this, of its municipality. We have the means to build a robust digital collection, even if that collection could and should be more extensive. But many libraries in the state are not so lucky. If we are feeling the pinch, then certainly they do as well. The library community is not seeking to take money out of the hands of publishers or creators. Authors for decades have understood the importance of libraries in promoting and supporting literacy in our nation and commercial publishing. If they didn't, they would not include libraries in their book tours, speaking engagements, or regularly attending and presenting at our conferences. What we seek are fair contract terms for taxpayers. The changes proposed in this bill would not reduce spending on eBooks. The industry's profit on a product that costs significantly less in overhead. Your three minutes is complete. Compared to other formats would remain the same, if not grow when budgets allow. Senator Hall, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to see you there. Um, uh, Scott, I'm gonna try that last name again. <laughs> Thank you and all your librarians who, who made the effort to be here. Um, and, and it's clearly universal. Everybody loves our librarians. Um, and you're here by your own advocacy. You don't have a lobbyist. You don't have people just kind of, you know, on a federal basis. This is about providing critical services to your community and users. And this is a huge chunk of your budget that could otherwise be used for outreach programs, summer reading programs, um, you know, uh, just just the whole array of services, like it's too long to describe. 
But what's important for me is you were previously the head librarian in Albany, New York. Albany, New York had proposed the same such legislation. It was uh, vetoed by then governor, by current governor Hochul. Um, take us through how we, you, the librarians, have learned the lesson in differentiating, as Ms. Shander described, that this is a different approach on contract law, very different from the preemption of federal and copyright protection. That's correct. I mean, my peers were brilliant in their approach by analyzing where there was a failure in the past and coming at it from, from a different direction. And, and again, this goes back to contracts and fair contracts. Um, and we don't have a seat at the table when discussing this. This is really like, th this is the cost, live with it, or we don't, pr we don't provide you the services that the public's demanding. I work the public service desk and I have had multiple conversations with members of the public about why it takes so long for them. And our wait list is much shorter than most of our peers wait lists, why it takes so long for them to get these items, these high demand items, and not even always high demand items. And they're amazed by not only um, the restrictions that are there that we don't own this, but for the fact that we pay so much more than the regular everyday consumer. So it's something that I think the libraries, have, librarians have felt really uh, supported by the public they serve because we've yet to have a conversation with a member of the public who thinks, oh my God, that's fair. That's totally fair. Um, and their understanding of the pressure that we feel in our budgets and our book budgets. Well, I think one of the things I've learned from this bill this year and, and in the past couple of years when this bill was raised by this committee is the awareness that has been raised. Most consumers just think this is the same cost as I would going to buy a audiobook or a, a digital book online to read on my Kindle through Amazon. But it's absolutely not the price. And, and I think as you've worked the public, public service desk or, or the info desk at our libraries, they're shocked. Yes. Just just shocked that this is allowed. And 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 I I, I thank all of your librarians, fellow librarians, uh, for making the effort to raise the awareness. Um, you're not looking to make a profit out of this. You're looking so that you can uh, uh, use your resources toward other benefits to the community. Um, I, I, I have an example that was shared with me, and I just wanted you to validate. Uh, but before I do the research, in talking to you after COVID, the rise of using ebooks and audiobooks has significantly spiked, which calls for an additional cost to you at this rate. Explain to people how the trend has evolved. Well, it's been interesting for Fairfield because we're not seeing a huge reduction in our physical circulation. So we are still in the need of purchasing physical books. This is just an additional format. It's an addition. It's not, there's no, you know, one for the other. We, we just met with our finance board and discussing our budget. We had to explain to them why last year we needed to ask for an increase in our book budget. It, there have been reductions every year and they couldn't believe we were asking for money. And it just simply... The fact that during COVID, ebooks became attractive to individuals who had never walked in the door. They realized that service was out there. This was an additional streaming service to them, and it attracted them to start using library services. Personally, I got text messages from friends. How do I sign up for a library card so that I can start using the ebook collection? So we now have to serve additional members of the public, and there are some members who read ebooks and physical books, depending on where they are, or what they're doing. So it's an addition. It's not, you know, it's not we, we have to sit down with our budget and say, are we going to do less programming so we can purchase more ebooks? Are we going to purchase less physical books or less magazines? And, and so that we can buy more physical books. It's 25% of our circulation, but it's one third of our book purchasing budget. Let me repeat that again. It's 25% of your circulation and it's a third of your budget. Yes. 
And then following that same line, I, I just wanted to point out, you know, Fairy Tale by Stephen King. Between a hard copy book and an ebook is a $50 difference. Yes. And Spare by Prince Henry. Harry. Harry. Prince Harry. Right? Is 1980 for a hard copy that you pay for and $55. Yes. And again, we're paying that $19 for a physical book, which will sit in our collection. Stephen King will probably be on that shelf for a hundred years. I'm not sure about Prince Harry, um, <laughs> but Stephen King will sit on that shelf for a hundred years, which means every year will continue to circulate. Whereas it's ebook format, it will disappear in a year or two and we don't own it. It's again, it's, we're asking for fair prices for taxpayers. We're asking for fair negotiated contracts that we can work with. We're not looking to take money away from the authors or the publishers or that industry. We're just asking for a better deal that makes sense for everyone. You had me at the Prince Harry point. Um, I know. I know. I, I just want to thank you for your efforts in outreach and community. I, I know that we see library in, in such a, 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 a important point. And, and we always assume that you will be there. Yes. And I think that's important. In addition to the ebook and the awareness, I, I really want to take the opportunity to thank all of you, but also to raise the importance of what you do as really the, the, the bed of democracy and knowledge that anyone can go into the library to get a book and, and, and that it is part of the social contract that we need to support you uh, as legislators, as municipal leaders and our budgetary process, because it's critical what you provide. It really, to me, is the foundation of, of democracy. So I want to thank you all and, and all your fellow librarians and, and many of our colleagues that support that as well. And, and, and I think once they learn more about it, it's not about any individual pushing a policy, but it is about a fairness and, and the support of our important libraries. So thank you. And um, I, I appreciate your time. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. There is no other question at this time. Thank you for your testimonial. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Tell Nikki, please. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for your testimony. You, you made a reference to your budget. And I think, what was it? 25% uh, of your... 25% of, circula of our circulation is ebooks. E and for our book budget, it's about a third of our book budget. So can you quantify in actual dollars how much it's gone up based on the cost of the ebooks versus the hard? hard Last year, we, fought, we asked for a $45,000 um, increase in our book budget. And it was primarily to cover ebook circulation. That, that, that's a big number. It's for a book budget, that's a significant number. And um, you know, we were, we were lucky that we, we didn't get all of that, but we got some of that. Um, and again, we're not seeing such a drop in physical book circulation that we would even think that we can move any more money from physical circulation into ebook circulation. Now, are you a grant agency of the community, the library? No. So we, we do all of our grants through the town. Wow. I'm just I'm just trying to wrap my arms around the uh, the cost that uh, libraries are actually experiencing here with the ridiculous pricing of the ebooks, because to me it is ridiculous pricing. Especially, it'd be one thing if it stayed there forever. It's another thing when it evaporates and, and disappears. And I think it's important for the publishing industry to understand that we're not going to reduce the amount of money that the demand is so high. We're not going to reduce the amount of money we're spending on eBooks. What this would allow is a little bit more capacity so we could add additional items to the collection. And I've got to think that uh, raising the extra money, obtaining the extra funds, if you're a, a grant agency, because some libraries and communities are grant agencies and they, they receive a grant from the town. 
I, I can see where there's going to be some serious budget troubles for libraries as we go forward and there's more of a demand for ebooks and dollars are dollars. Yes. Well, you, you put a good focal point on the issue, especially when you start talking about the dollars and cents that it's going to cost to be able to deliver the service that's needed by the public. And I thank you for coming forward here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. There is no other question at this time. Thank you so very much uh, for your testimonial. Uh, Donna Hamzi, please, followed by Chris Ed. Thank you, Senator Rahman, um, members of the Planning and Development Committee. It's a pleasure to be before you today on behalf of the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities. We have submitted testimony on several bills before you on the agenda, but I will uh, limit my comments to two of those bills specifically related to TOD and housing production. Uh, CCM appreciates the focus and attention the governor has given to housing and for his comments in support of local zoning authority. However, CCM does not support any proposal that threatens a municipality's ability to receive discretionary funds. In addition, we would request that whenever a municipality is required to comply with standards at the discretion of a particular authority, as is the case in section three of Senate Bill 985, that the municipality be provided due process to appeal such decision. We look forward to working with the governor and stakeholders to continue to refine many of the housing proposals before the legislature. The second bill is Senate Bill 1141, which seeks, as you've heard, to allow for as of right development of housing. Uh, CCM is generally supportive of the bill's intention. However, we do not support the bill as drafted without proper enabling language included. And CCM would encourage that the bill be amended to provide municipalities with the ability to opt out of this requirement by the a vote of their legislative body. Again, CCM encourages the committee to proceed with caution when acting on the aforementioned, aforementioned bills and to consider our, um, our testimony when doing that and that we look forward to being a resource and a teammate in crafting legislation around housing and housing development that meets the needs of all Connecticut residents and municipalities. Happy to answer any questions. At this time, there is no other question. Thank you so very much for your testimonial. Uh, Chris Ace, please. Good afternoon, Representative DeGraw, Senator Rahman, Senator Fazio, Representative Zulo, and other representatives uh, of the Planning and Development Committee. Uh, my name is Chris Edge. I'm the Economic Development Director of the Town of Berlin. I'm here today to speak briefly on a couple different bills. Uh, the first is 985, which I think is good in its intention to incentivize housing through housing growth zones but it must be done in coordination with municipal leaders and must not include as of right language within agreements between the state and towns. The next is Bill 1141, which uh, Mayor Elliker was talking about. Um, and with that one, legislation states that as of right and without a public hearing that multifamily units are allotted 15 units an acre within a half mile of a train station, which we have. We have a train station bordered by a large 13 acre industrial site and three to four neighborhoods would have been in existence since the 1950s. 15 units an acre would affect both of those very greatly, including taking valuable industrial land and making it then by right at 15 acres, or 15 per unit per acre, excuse me. Additionally, language states the municipality does not adopt any regulations. Any non-compliant existing regulation shall be null and void. I understand the need for multi housing, but this seems to be a lot to ask of a town. As of right, it's a lot for the state to put in legislation as well as making local zoning regulations void. In Berlin, we now have over 450 units of multifamily housing under construction with approximately 20% affordable. We're at about 9% right now and have been working hard to move that to 10%. This state mandate will take local control away and push development into the areas where it's either not appropriate or where it negatively affect residents who have been in their neighborhoods for decades. Near our train station, we did a development which was 26 units an acre with a private developer next to the train station. So we have seen dense and done dense. And one thing uh, with respect to uh, Mayor Elliker, he had said the word requirement. Uh, if this is passed, it will be a mandate. It won't be a requirement. 1192, I applaud this committee and the state for finding ways to incentivize workforce housing development projects instead of mandating as in 1141. In section six, I would ask that Chifa create new programs that do not leave out some of the provisions or assistance for over 55 housing. Many residents of Berlin still work, but due to the cost of housing, cannot afford to live in the community they help build. An over 55 program would help considerably, not just on the workforce side, but in helping those who made the foundation of the community to be able to stay and grow old here. 
I'm very happy to see Bill 6808 coming before you today with this bill, which will ask DDS to develop an administrative competitive grant program for the construction of new residential housing for those intellectual or development disabilities. Previous to my role in Berlin, I was a job developer for Favar, the Ark of the Farmington Valley. It was most of the wonderful jobs I've ever had. But the clients that we helped to find jobs had major challenges finding housing in the community outside of their parents' home. This bill will make these projects possible as the costs, sometimes including costly modifications needed for some residents, much more financially viable. I was gonna, wasn't gonna mention it, but 6,800, um, during COVID, uh, our library in Berlin was the busiest building in town, no question about it, because that's where people felt safe and they could go to. Um, in Avon, where I live, I would say it's, our library is probably my third favorite building after my house, my favorite coffee shop, Beans and Company, and then the library. Your three minutes is complete. And okay, just quickly, I would ask that you move these bills ahead and either change the language of 1141 or recreate it in a way that works with towns like Berlin who are working, trying to get to 10%. Mandating from above is something that takes away all say locally and can impact communities in a way that cannot be seen truly from Hartford because every community is separate and different. Thank you. Thank you so much. At this time, I don't see any uh, question. Uh, thank you for your uh, testimonial. Uh, Elizabeth Lane, Paula Karen, Tobosky, Walter. Thank you and welcome. Good afternoon, distinguished members of the Planning and Development Committee. Thank you for your time and attention to these important matters that impact access to information of all kinds to every resident in our state, both young and old. My name is Elizabeth Lane, and I live in Bloomfield, Connecticut. I have the privilege of serving the wonderful community of Bloomfield as the director of Bloomfield Public Library. I'm also a mom of young readers, as evidenced by my son over there. I'm writing, I am speaking today in support of HB 6800 about ebooks. I'm in the very important business of connecting people to information. It may sound easy, but I can assure you that it is not. Accessing information in an equitable way is a social justice issue. Libraries are struggling to break down the many barriers to access, but we do not have the staffing or monetary resources to battle the power of corporate entities who keep rewriting the rules and more problematically, libraries pay a lot more for digital materials than the general consumer. Last month alone, Bloomfield paid $1,000 for 18 ebooks that we will never own. Rather, they disappear from our online library after two years or 12 months, as most titles are licensed in this way. This is a burden to our budgets and by extension, our taxpayers. As is the trend across Connecticut, use of our online collections surged during COVID-19 and these numbers remain high. We cannot maintain or develop these collections in the current unregulated environment. We need your help to help us use tax dollars in the same way the average person uses their money to buy an ebook. We need the government to step in. When ebook legislation went through this process in Maryland two years ago, I excitedly wrote Senator Slap and Representative Gibson asking them to follow suit in Connecticut. In truth, we should have asked for help more than a decade ago. We are asking you to help level the playing field for libraries of all kinds, public, school, and academic by creating a bill that allows us to better connect people to information without all of the added barriers and increased cost the publishing industry is putting up. I want to quickly share five points from the American Library Association um, about this topic. Number one, they think all published works must be available for libraries to purchase and lend. Two, access to and use of ebooks must equitably balance the rights and privileges of readers, authors, and publishers. Three, digital content must be accessible to all people, regardless of physical or reading disabilities. Four, library patrons must be able to access digital content of, on the device of their choosing. And five, reading records must remain private. You may also find an April 26, 2022 letter to the Rhode Island legislature from the American Library Association urging the passage of ebooks legislation of interest. As that letter states, we need your help to enable public libraries to continue in the digital age to fulfill our mission of providing the public with access to information. Stick up for school libraries, stick up for public libraries. Thank you and remember that just like you, libraries work to serve all. We must have ebooks for all. Thank you. Representative Ski, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for your testimony. So you're you're paying somewhere in the in the neighborhood of about sixty dollars a an ebook based on the the numbers that you presented. That is correct. Now, is the library a grant agency or is it a, a function of the town per se? It's a function of the town. So what's this done to your budget and how's it hit the town's budget and cause an obvious increase in the taxes? So the problem is we have people coming to the library and our job is to raise readers and provide resources. When people come and see that their tax dollars are not able to get them something that they would like in a proper amount of time, first of all, it signals to people that we can't serve them. So it puts the library in a negative light when that's the opposite of what we're trying to do. Um, also, I, I think that if more people understood what was happening, they would be very upset. Um, I know that uh, in Bloomfield, you know, when you have a family come in looking for a book and you tell them, oh, I'm sorry, it's going to be months before this is available to you. That does not help literacy. That does not help our students and our families. So this tax issue, I think it, it affects so much more than what people think. So I've got to assume that many a time a student will come in looking to research something. And do you have a situation where the ebook that the student would be looking for for the research paper he might be doing for for high school or for college, what would happen there? So because we are so limited with the amount of ebooks we can purchase, Sadly, right now, Bloomfield is opting for a model where we only are purchasing ebooks that already have holds on them or that we know are going to immediately be used. So it's putting us in a situation where we're where we are not purchasing copies of materials that the public may want. We're purchasing only what we know they want. And we know that there's a very small percentage of our public that actually put holds on materials before we have them. So there's a whole lot that we are not getting. Now, these holds that people are putting on the books, uh, you, you said something to the effect of months? Yes. Yes. So there are times when the waiting list, um, you could be waiting six months for um, an ebook that you wanted to read. Or longer. Or longer. That... Uh... I want to thank you for coming forward and presenting your testimony there, because when I, I hear six months or, or longer to actually be able to have an opportunity to read the book, at that point, is it still relevant to what's going on? Correct. And in Bloomfield, we're lucky that we can spend $1,000 on 18 books or so. There's a lot of communities in Connecticut that cannot do that. So you see that equity issue playing out in every community. And as a previous colleague stated earlier, um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Um, oh, so in Connecticut with physical materials and many materials, you can go into any library and borrow that material with eBooks. That is not always the case. So there's times too, where it might only be two libraries in the state that have it, but the licensing terms won't let allow somebody else from another community to borrow that material, which goes against all of the other aspects of what public libraries in Connecticut do. Uh, yeah. That just hit me because my understanding with public libraries is there was a reciprocity from whether if I'm in South Windsor and I go over to Bloomfield and I show my South Windsor library card, I can take a book out. Correct. So that same reciprocity does not exist with an ebook? Correct. With many of these platforms, and including the one that we're talking about for Bloomfield, a lot of those materials are only for Bloomfield residents. And I'm trying to uh, recall and help me out here. The reciprocity, I, I believe that was actually by state statute. Correct. So, Ooh. yes, I see. I see the folks behind me <laughs> nodding. Yes. So, so basically, the eBooks, in and of themselves, are actually violating state statute if they don't allow the reciprocity, the ability of me to go to Bloomfield and take out whatever book I want to take out, and and there's a an issue there. That is correct. Now that brings an interesting light to the whole issue. 
because if if somehow they're violating state statute, does that actually give the legislature some kind of additional power to do something to try to rectify this? Because they, in and of themselves, based on their action of not allowing that reciprocity, violating the sta state statute that guarantees that, uh, what's the recourse? And that's something we would obviously have to try to find out. Thank you for coming forward, and I'm glad you. Uh, I'm glad we got into the dialogue on on borrowing books from one town to another, and the fact that there is no or there is a limited reciprocity when it comes to some of the folks that actually sell you yes. a license on the ebook. Thank you. And again, extending that equity issue. So you're in a town that doesn't have the budget for this, and you want to go to another town, and you see how there it it leaves a lot of people out. You know, and, and one final comment, uh, Mr. Chair. So if I live in one of the small communities in the quiet corner in the northeastern part of the state, I could very well find myself going to, say, the Bloomfield Library to take a book out and finding out that because I don't live in Bloomfield and the licensing on the book, ebook, won't allow it. Correct. Thank you. Thank you for coming forward with that information. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. So there is no other question right now. Thank you so very much coming and taking thank your you time all. and testimony. Thank you. Karen Dobrowski, followed by Glenn Garber. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, honorable co-chairs, uh, vice chairs, ranking members, and all members of the uh, Planning and Development Committee. I'm Karen Dubois Walton, and I respect, respectfully submit testimony uh, in support of Senate Bill 985, and act incentivizing housing production with some amendments. Um, I've submitted my written testimony and, and hope that you'll take a look at that. Um, I do serve as the president of Elm City Communities, where the housing authority in the city of New Haven. Um, a developer and operator of affordable housing communities. Um, as we all know, our state has a drastic housing shortage. Vacancy rates and home sale inventories are at all time lows all across the state. And this shortage has driven up rents in every county in our state by an average of more than 20% over the last couple of years. It's devastating rock renters, locking families out of home ownership and suffocating our economy. To resolve our shortage, we need to build more. SB 985 will help to encourage house, housing production through incentives, providing meaningful financing for new construction in towns that rezone to allow new housing development. This is good, but frankly, I don't believe that SB 985 as written will lead to much new housing construction. For the most part, Connecticut's towns aren't not building housing because of lack of financing. They're not building housing because local regulations prevent housing construction. It's local zoning and building codes that prevent multifamily development, the kind of development that served as the foundation for most of Connecticut's great places, and it's local zoning and building codes that must be changed. And some say we need more taxpayers, not more taxes, but we won't add more taxpayers if there aren't homes for them to live in. The state has an economic incentive to reward the towns that are building housing and to encourage future housing development. And so to that end, I've attached to my written testimony draft language for a proposal we call the Housing Growth Fund. We propose that the Housing Growth Fund be added to Senate Bill 985 to better realize the purpose of the bill. The fund would directly pay towns that build housing, re rewarding them for the work they do to resolve our crisis and creating a real incentive for other towns to do the same. Senate Bill 985 as written helps to finance the new construction we need, and that's useful but the housing growth fund goes a step further by rewarding the actual approval of homes and by funding towns housing growth to build virtuous cycles of development and investment. Certainly happy to discuss further changes to the bill or alterations to our housing growth fund model as drafted, but it's vital that Connecticut invest in the communities that build new housing in order to strengthen our economy and move towards a future growth. I wanna note that our bill, Senate Bill 985 as written, nor our amendment language mandate zoning changes for any town. Instead, adding the housing growth fund to Senate Bill 985 will help to realize the intent of the bill, which is to incentivize housing production. 
Bond financing alone will not increase a town's motivation to build new homes. That's not the obstacle, but the housing growth fund directly paying towns for home construction and shift, shifts the local consideration, hopefully encouraging more towns to pursue the kind of reforms that can make our state stronger. We have an opportunity to build a bright future. Is complete. Thank you. I urge you to support this uh, bill with the inclusion of the housing growth fund. So no question at this time. Karen, nice to see you. Thank you um, for thank your you. time and taking time to testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Glenn, go to Glenn, please. Good afternoon, Senator Rahman, Senator Fazio, and all the honorable members of the Planning and Development Committee. My name is Glenn Gruby, and I speak today in support of House Bill 6800, an act concerning electronic book and digital audiobook licensing. As the library director of the Avon Free Public Library, my role is stewardship over a public resource and public funds. I always endeavor to use these funds in an, as economically as possible to provide informational, educational, and entertaining content to library users in my community. The restrictive licensing terms and expensive licensing costs of most ebooks makes it extremely difficult to provide a deep and broad collection of titles for my library's patrons. Ebooks that cost between $10 and $15 for consumers can cost a library four to six times as much and come with a license that expires after one or two years or a couple dozen loans, meaning I need to repurchase the same content again and again for popular titles. By way of example, last year, Avon Library spent about $36,000 on ebook licensing. Uh, that gave us, based on the average cost of a library license, access to 625 titles for my users. Um, by comparison, using the average cost of a consumer license for an ebook, we would have had access to over 3,000 titles that wouldn't expire after two years. This is not efficient use of taxpayer dollars. Library users frequently complain about the long wait list for ebooks, not understanding that in addition to needing to treat these digital files akin to physical books, loaning to them to borrowers one at a time and waiting for them to be returned before another user can borrow them, Libraries are forced to pay such high licensing fees that providing multiple copies of bestsellers, something we commonly do with print books, is cost prohibitive. This is not an effective way to serve our users. While some readers prefer borrowing print books, there are many reasons aside from convenience that others gravitate to or require ebooks. Visual or learning disabilities can make an ebook the best option for some. Font size and screen contrast can be adjusted. Your smartphone, tablet, or computer can read the book to you as you follow along with the text. Uh, if you suffer from dyslexia or, or are an English as second language reader, these are important features. My younger child, a freshman at the University of Hartford and an avid reader, has dyslexia and is greatly benefited from reading ebooks. These accessibility features are crucial to some and make ebooks an important part of any library's collection. Providing free and convenient access to information in a variety of formats is a core mission of libraries, and I urge the legislature to act in the best interest of library users and all taxpayers and pass House Bill 6800. This bill will help create a level playing field where libraries can provide the content uh, that our readers want while preserving our funding for other priorities. Thank you. There's no question. Thank you so very much Thank for you. coming and taking time for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Chair Sabaji. Chair Arastri. Chair Arastri, please. We're moving Adam Rockman. Adam. Good moving. afternoon, members. I'm sorry, this is Adam Brockmeyer from the SFA. Are you ready? Yeah, okay. Thank you. My apologies. Uh, good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Adam Bye. Brockmeyer. That's okay. Welcome. My apologies. Good afternoon, members of the committee. I'm from the Surety and Fidelity, Surety and Fidelity Association of America, and I'm testifying in opposition to Senate Bill 1135 today. 
I'm not going to repeat all of the points that Eric George made in our uh, joint testimony, but I do want to emphasize a couple of points of what surety bonds do for municipalities. And uh, we think it would be a, a, a bad public policy decision to uh, move away from surety bonds guaranteeing projects at the municipal level. Surety bonds provide uh, vetting of the contractors. They review the contractor's uh, workforce, uh, financial capacity to report information to the state. And they also work with the contractor throughout the job. If a municipality has any questions about whether the contractor is performing the job on time, on budget, or the quality of the work in any way, the municipality can pick up the phone, call the surety, and the surety can uh, address any concerns the municipality may have. Um, there's also a very important point about surety bonds, and that is surety bonds protect suppliers and subcontractors. A lot of times these are very small businesses that if they're not paid by the general contractor or, or a general contractor insolvency, um, a twenty dollars or $30,000 hit to a small business would be devastating. And having a surety bond in place is something that a lot of suppliers and subcontractors very much support. Um, I would also like to say that uh, surety bonds also take control over a, a job if it fails. Um, removing surety bonds from the equation would transfer a lot of uh, responsibilities to the municipality that the surety does today, vetting contractors, that. monitoring contractors, as well as any financial commitments should the costs overrun. Um, we are very concerned about any idea of, of raising the level to 5 million because we're concerned that some municipalities may try it and it would end in financial disaster. There were questions raised earlier about whether Connecticut's law is antiquated or what other states are doing. I have a couple data points and I'm gonna work with Eric George to get these points to uh, Senator Fazio. 42 states are at the federal threshold of $150,000 or lower. So Connecticut is not an outlier by any means. And many states have these lower thresholds, we believe, because many suppliers and subcontractors, smaller businesses, they want the, um, uh, the protection that the bonds provide. And the municipalities rely on the surety to monitor the job and ensure that the job is done to the municipality's um, 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 ex expectations. Um, with that, I will conclude my testimony and thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Thank you. There is no question at this time. Thank you so very much for taking time and uh, your testimonial. Thank you. Team, team Bolzon, please, followed by Elizabeth Rosso. Team, please. Team Blasky, followed by Elizabeth Rosso. I believe Cher Savage is now available. Okay. Yes. Hi, I'm available. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Okay. I would like to read to the committee what I have about, uh, can I start reading? Please. Hello. I can start reading. Okay. I have dear committee. I am Cher Savage and live at 16 Laura Lane, New Haven, Connecticut. I am the daughter of Henry Savage a New Haven, Connecticut firefighter who died in the line of duty, excuse me, <clears throat> 1982. After some years in year 2000, the state of Connecticut passed bill number 5838LCO4123 enacting a property tax abatement for the surviving spouse of a firefighter who dies in the line of duty. My mother and surviving spouse Lorraine Savage of 16 Laura Lane, New Haven, Connecticut, received the tax abatement until her passing on November 11th, 2010. I am requesting an amendment be made to bill number 5838LCO4123 to include the surviving children living in or owning the home of a firefighter who died in line of duty I request this amendment include past firefighters in line of duty deaths. The children of fallen firefighters face a life of grief and in these challenging and economic times should not have the additional stress of increasing property tax. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimonial. At this time, we don't have any question. I see that team uh, online now. Please welcome team. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, co-chairs, Cabros de Graw and Raman, and ranking members Fazio and Zulo and members of the Planning and Development Committee. My name is Tim Valenskis. I'm a 20 year resident of Ridgefield. I have experience as a builder and developer and have been following the zoning affordable housing issue very closely for over 20 years. In regard to SB 1141 and SB 985, I fully support the concept of transit oriented development, but feel any proposals at this time should be incentive based, voluntary and non punitive. Also, I'm very leery of the state writing prescriptive zoning code with hard numbers that all towns, regardless of their differences, must comply with. As we have seen with A30G, it is very difficult to modify flawed state policy once it is enacted. Uh, a brief statement of four principles and my, my solution. Uh, number one, I believe lower cost market rate housing that is well designed is an inherent public good and is deserving of some type of preferred status. Two, I believe that localities are in the best position to implement zoning. Three, I believe the best way to provide a housing benefit is to subsidize individuals, not buildings. Too much of state policy is geared toward providing a project-based housing benefit. There are many drawbacks to this approach, including, but not limited to, the need for market rate renters to subsidize deed restricted units in A30G set aside projects and inclusionary zoning. Also, in the words of Bob Ellickson, the horizontal inequity is manifest in the project based approach. Uh, one household may be living in a $500,000 subsidized unit, while another, just as deserving household, gets nothing except a place on a waiting list. And four, there is no coherent comprehensive planning vision for the state of Connecticut. The question of what the best balance between growing our cities or suburbs simply has not been addressed. It wasn't that long ago that the Lamont administration talked of doubling the size of our cities, yet all the policy pro proposals that we've seen to date seem to focus on growing our suburbs. So what's the answer? Uh, I believe the Planning and Development Committee's own model code working group in the CCDF is showing a way for a comprehensive solution. The form-based zoning code templates that they are currently discussing should be fully developed at the council of government level with input from both localities and the state and created for a variety of different neighborhood typologies, including the different TOD areas. These form-based code templates that will facilitate the construction of new lower cost market rate housing would then be implemented at the local level in exchange for exemption from 830G. Even, uh, even in California, they give, they give municipalities the ability to write their own code that complies with an, uh, an uh, objective standard to avoid the builder's remedy. And You're Connecticut towns are essentially great. stuck with the builder's remedy regardless <clears throat> of their efforts. Thank you. No question at this time. Thank you for your testimony. Rebecca, Rebecca Harlow, please. Followed by Jeff Jens. Rebecca. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Senator Rahman, Representative Kavros de Gras, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Rebecca Harlow. I work for the Case Memorial Library in Orange and reside in Woodbridge. And I'm here to express my support for HB 6800. I'm the chair of the ebook committee for Lion, the third largest library consortium in Connecticut. And I've been managing our digital book collection through Overdrive for the last 10 years. In that time, I've gathered um, a lot of data and I've been tracking trends. And I'd like to share some of that with you today to illustrate just how unreasonable the current terms are um, that are set by publishers. So when Lion began purchasing ebooks in 2007, all books were sold under a one copy, one user model, um, which I don't know has, has been addressed yet, but that's a model where you purchase it one time, you keep that in perpetuity and you can lend it out to one user at a time. Um, at that time, we paid under $20 per copy, and it was the only time that the, ter the terms were similar to what we see for our print collections. The first major shift in terms happened in 2012 when publishers um, adopted the metered model, which is what we've been talking about now, where those copies expire after 12 months or 
two years or a certain number of circulations. Over the next 10 years, more publishers adopted this model and costs continued to increase anywhere from 5 to 20% per year. Now in 2023, over 82% of the books we purchase are metered and the average cost is over $42 per title, which is a 100% increase over the last 10 years. We spend between 30 to 40% of our budget now just replacing a small fraction of the metered titles that have expired. Um, by comparison, my library spends far, far less than 1% of our budget replacing print books. On average, the Lion Consortium spends over $20,000 a month on digital books, most of which is spent just trying to keep existing holds lists down. There is a minimum six month long wait list for almost every new title in our collection. And we have to gather at least a four month hold queue for expired titles to be repurchased before we can even afford to repurchase them. And that's 40% of our budget. Uh, by the end of the year, the Lion Consortium will have spent over 2 million taxpayer dollars on digital books through Overdrive, not including the $50,000 annual hosting fee that we pay to Overdrive just to host that content. In the last 10 years, we've lost access to over $1 million worth of content. If we stop purchasing digital books today, by 2025, we would have only 14,000 books to show for a nearly $2 million taxpayer investment. Um, another thing that I don't think we've touched on yet is that the publishers are changing um, the model for audiobooks such that most audiobooks are only available um, as downloadable content. And we're seeing most of our circulation for audiobooks is downloadable. So in the last year, 94% of Lions... Circulation. I'm sorry, I'll wrap up in just a second. 94% of our audiobook circulation was downloadable. Only 6% was a physical format. And part of that is because the physical format doesn't exist anymore for most books. Um, we saw a 28% increase in circulation in COVID. Um, for digital books, that has not gone down. My library budget um, for books in comparison is 36% less than it was in 2008. If you're a child, if you're a teen, if you read in a language other than English, if you just simply read nonfiction, libraries cannot afford to meet your needs under the current terms offered by publishers. Um, the American Association of Publishers said in testimony that they're serving us well. I hope you will agree that this is not a system that serves libraries in our communities well. So on behalf of our consortium, my library, the residents of Connecticut, I want to thank you for your support for this bill. And I'd be happy to answer any questions um, or answer follow-up questions on any um, ebook data. Thank you. There is no question. Okay, Dil Nicky, please. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. You you talked a lot of percentages, percentage of increases. Mm -hmm. you actually, talk actual dollars and cents. Sure. So, um, yeah. So, in in terms of cost, like per book and cost or cost um, talked, per year. You you talked about how the budget went up on the ebooks over a period of time in percentages. Mm -hmm. And if you could just run us through what the, the dollar figures were. Sure. So um, when we started purchasing um, through Overdrive, downloadable content through Overdrive, we were paying just under $20 on average per copy. Um, and each year there was anywhere between a five to 20% increase um, to that average cost. Right now, our average cost per title is a little over $42, um, which is a little bit lower than some of the other figures that we've heard because my library, my consortium typically only purchases books under that 12 month um model so the the cost is a little bit lower than the um yeah than the 24 month model um and that's simply because we're just choosing to spend as little money as possible and shuffle that money around as best we can but um it's uh, around 42 dollars per copy but that also doesn't 
you know, there's there's a lot of really high cost things. And I think that we'll see in this fiscal year that that average cost is significantly higher because audiobooks are now averaging over $100 um, per copy in that metered model. Well, I thank you for that information because I didn't realize that there was a 12 month rental fee versus a, and I'll call it a rental fee because it, you're basically renting it. Sure. Rent fee for, for 12 months versus 24 months. And it's probably what, a little more of a discount per month on the 24 month one then. Or it's no? exactly half um, in most cases. And every publisher gets to decide those terms on their own. But generally speaking, it's exactly half. Um, you know, there are a lot, there are a lot of models that are being tested out in this market now. Um, and I, usually when we see that, um, one to two years later, the publishers kind of choose whichever model I think benefits them most. And they try to gather that data. So right now they're testing out a model where you have the option to choose between a one copy, one user model for audiobooks, or you can choose the metered. And there's a significant cost savings to choose the metered model. And so most libraries do that because that's all they can afford to do. But I think that what we'll see is that meter or the one copy, one user model will probably go away soon. So there's a, a lot of, um, you know, shifting terms that happen. Well, thank you for clarifying that for me. And I appreciate the fact that you're here testifying, especially this late in the day. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. There is no other question right now. Thank you for your testimony. Thank uh, you. Followed for by uh, Elizabeth Russo, followed by Jeff Jens. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Rahman, Representative Kabar Stigraw, Senator Huang, and the honorable members of the Planning and Development Committee. My name is Elizabeth Rousseau, and I'm here today in support of House Bill 6800. I'm a resident of West Hartford and have had a library card since before kindergarten. I'm a big reader, and I particularly prefer reading digital audiobooks and ebooks. In the past several years, especially while I was in college, during the pandemic, the main way that my public library served me has been through ebook and digital audiobook collections. As a recent college graduate, I'm working a job that I love in my community, but I don't make enough money to buy every book I want to read. I pre-order new releases from Riverbend Bookshop, but the majority of what I read is from the library's digital collection. I feel frustrated by the disparity in collection development between physical books and digital books, and in particular, digital audiobooks. I believe that if library purchasing was more equitable, I could be better served by my local library. To illustrate my experience using Libby to borrow digital audiobooks, I offer this anecdote. I recently read the first book in a fairly popular series. After reading the first book, I placed holds on the second and fourth books in the series. I ended up reading the fourth book next because that hold came through first. And I'll probably read the second book this weekend between rides in the car, walking my dog, and cooking. Of the nine books in the series, only these three titles are in the collection. I will have to strategically use my four hoopla borrows a month if I want to finish the series in my preferred format. I also want to share the length of time I'm currently projected to wait on my Libby holds. Two weeks for two books, four weeks for two books, eight weeks for one book, 12 weeks for one book, 13 weeks for one book, 22 weeks for another book, and several months for two other books on my holds list. I'm 43rd in line for a book that, that 56 people are waiting for and there's only one copy. I wonder if it will actually be fulfilled. This is a normal experience for readers using Libby to access library collections. My friends commiserate in waiting months to read books that we're actually interested in. Thank you for your action on this issue. There is no other question, question right now. Thank you so very much for taking time and coming and testify. This is very important, uh, Bill. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
Up next, we have Rebecca Harlow, followed by Jeff Gentis. And I think I always say your name wrong, so correct me when you. <laughs> Rebecca first, Rebecca Harlow. Yeah. Um, oh, Rebecca's done. Oh, I'm so sorry, Jeff. And then followed by Water Topliff. Walter, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? It's going to be actually be Ann Minuski because Walter was here earlier. So, but we've got Jeff. So, <laughs> to see you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, so, yes, Senator Rahman, uh, Representative Cabros de Gras, Senator Fazio, uh, and other members of the Plan Development Committee. Uh, my name is Jeff Gentis. Thanks for allowing me to testify today. Um, I work at Connecticut Fair Housing Center and I co supervise a clinic at Yale. Um, I'm here on two bills. Uh, and I have written testimony on both, but so I'll just respond to some of the testimony that's been submitted since and that you've heard today. Um, the first one is a little bit easier. It's uh, House Bill 6806, someone involving the revaluation of Weathersfield. And why would we submit testimony on this? Uh, I have no personal beef with Weathersfield. It's just that anytime the revaluation requests come up, I appreciate um, a level of scrutiny because they inherently perpetuate some level of unfairness that takes place when there's a lag in revaluation. So I appreciated Representative Delnicki's interrogatories um, to ensure that the, the reasons were good for deferring revaluation. Um, and they perpetuate you know, the inequalities, not just amongst uh, homeowners, but also as a matter of race. And so as a fair housing center, we're um, skeptical of uh, revaluations uh, delays. The, the second bill is Senate Bill 1142. That involves reducing the uh, the penalty rate on paying property taxes from 18% down to 12. It used to be that that rate was not a penalty rate, but was just trying to keep people from sticking money in a savings account and getting a better return rather than paying their, their taxes. So that rate kept going up from the mid 60s up until 1982 when it 18, hit 18% and has never come back down. Um, the Some of the testimony I saw was you know, from small towns saying, well, we like getting 18%. We don't want to get 12. And I just don't think it should be a punitive measure. Um, we've never, we work with a lot of people who are facing foreclosures as a result of taxes and no one's trying to game the system. No one's trying to avoid their bills. It's some death, divorce, disability, economic, uh, some other kind of economic hardship, unemployment, failure of their business um, and hitting them with 18% is just quite a bit. There, there was an excuse put in saying like, well, hey, the state collects more uh, in terms of penalty fee and the interest rate, but that's partly, that's, that's not as bad because the state doesn't go around and then foreclose for unpaid tax bills. And so for that reason, um, and others, we support Senate Bill 1142 and, uh, thanks for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much. Senator Fazio. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. Um, you make a very good point on the interest rate. There's a, there's a lien. Uh, against a house, against a property, it's not you know, it's not an unsecured claim. It's a it's a secured claim, and so that that's a very strong argument for a lower interest rate. I was wondering if you had thought about having a float a floating interest rate, that it's against interest rates generally, so that the legislature doesn't have to constantly go in and adjust. I mean, not that it's constantly doing it; yeah. it hasn't done it in many years as yeah. interest rates have gone down. But now you see them going back up. So I wonder if if you have any thoughts on making it floating. I hear you, um, and yeah, it would be easier. Right. As opposed to passing a bill every three years, especially given this year that the prime rate moved like four points in, in 2022. Um, the problem is that in the course of accounting over a period of time, trying to make sure and we see this on adjustable rate mortgages, especially if they get transferred or assigned to another buyer. Um, I just did a deposition a couple of weeks ago on someone who bought a loan that was originated in 06 with an adjustable interest rate. They have no records prior to 2013 as to what's owed or what was charged. And with towns having that ability to assign tax debt, I trust the bookkeepers and our tax collectors to keep records as to what the applicable tax rate is. I don't trust it when it's assigned. Um, so, um, and, you know, and also I, I, the town clerk, the town collectors or the tax collectors may, you know, raise other, like it's harder that way. So that's, I guess, I guess those are the considerations. Something that's more efficient, like requires less work. You don't have to bring a bill to the floor every time to make it equitable versus um, ease of record keeping. Yeah, I hear you. Well, I appreciate your testimony. Thank sure. you. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Delnicki. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It's good to see you. Uh, Same. I was going to ask you which bill you liked better. Sure. But I'm not going to put you on the spot. I know we had in banking that we JF out and, and this bill here. Uh, hopefully, and I'm just making an observation, hopefully we get it done one way or the other. Uh, what are your thoughts, though, on the concept of capping on a, on a judgment the legal fees at 15% at max? Because that's in the other bill. I think that's great. Uh, I mean, we see, I mean, just one, one example. It, a lot of the folks who handle the other bill especially speaks to the assigned tax debt and sure. the um, the uh, the aggressiveness, if not scruples, of those lawyers might might differ from all those who handle the municipal tax board closures on behalf of our towns. Uh, but what we see, what we can see, is um, just a lot of padding of bills without a lot of scrutiny because people don't tend to fight their tax foreclosures because I, you, you can have a case where you're asking questions about why did you charge this? Why is this this way? Just the confusing nature of, for instance, if you didn't make your, uh, your, your July 2023 payment, that's for your grand list 2021. And saying, oh, now I'm behind on my 2021 bill, what does that mean? Just asking those kinds of pretty basic questions. Um, justifies the attorney going around going, oh, thank you. That's a nice point too. And just adding to the bill. Um, so we think that's a great way to, um, you know, reduce what's already a pretty sizable expense thanks, expense, thanks to the interest and the fact that people have to come up with money relatively quickly to make up for um, years past. So I, I, I and I will say, I, I think both bills are great <laughs> between the two. And I, I would love to work with you um, to have them work in harmony so that they're, um, I think they achieve two different purposes, um, though related, and um, would love to make it work for uh, for more residents that way. Yeah, and I, I pretty much asked that question from the concept of uh, some legislative background. So if we end up coming out with this bill here out of this out of this committee, and of course, we have the bill out of the banking committee. In the banking committee, a couple of years ago, we actually broke ground on the folks that purchased these tax liens and created the first rules of the road to actually give a modicum of fairness to people that are going through it. Because that was a huge, that, that has actually been a business in some cities, and I'm not going to name them. But it has been a business. I'll let you know. <laughs> so, so whatever we do, hopefully what we come out with is the same type product so that there is a continuity between the two. Even though I'm a little bit um, partial to the one in banking as the ranking member there and starting the process a couple of years back, uh, when a constituent of mine was actually hit with a problem from one of these third party folks and when the town had actually agreed to utilize them, I, I, I made them a promise. I promised them the first time somebody came to my yard, came to my driveway, wagged their finger and said, Tom, this is what's going on. And they were being treated unfairly. I made them a promise that we would do something about it. So I'm glad to see whether it comes out this year, comes out of planning and development or comes out of banking, there needs to be uniformity between the two solutions. And Jeff, I appreciate you coming forward. And I'm not gonna ask you which bill you like better. <laughs> Don't wanna put you on that spot. And I, I think between the two bills we have with any luck, we can come together with some kind of mutual agreement on what they are so that regardless of which one ends up, if it gets called, it accomplishes what we've already set out for. Thanks. I'm just going to phrase it a little differently. It's not about like, <laughs> are, are there pieces to the other bill that might be an improvement to this bill or vice versa? Yeah. So the other bill does, I think, two major things. It says if you assign your tax debt, the interest rate goes from what's now 18 down to 12. Okay. So if you had 12 across the board here, you'd accomplish that 
first purpose. The second purpose is to cap attorney's fees at 15% okay. of the judgment, which is common for a lot of kind of forms of other kinds of debt collection. Mm -hmm. um, and ha adopting that here would be great. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank Have you. Have a great weekend. You too. Okay. I do not see uh, number 34, Ann Minuski in our Zoom room. So I'm going to go on to Erin uh, Dunmire and I'll go back to Ann if she shows up. Erin, you're up. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the Planning and Development Committee. My name is Erin Dumeyer, and I'm the director of the Mark Twain Library in Reading. I'm also a Stanford resident, a member of the Connecticut Library Association Board, and the parent of two future readers. I'm speaking today to voice my support for HB 6800, an act concerning electronic book and digital audiobook licensing. Since the beginning of the pandemic, digital material usage has exploded at the Mark Twain Library. Circulation of digital materials increased by 42% in February of this year as compared to this time in 2019. But as our digital materials become more and more popular, it has become increasingly difficult to keep up with demand. For example, right now our digital item with the longest wait list is Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus. If you were to place a hold on it today, on March 10th, it would most likely be available to you sometime in August. As a library user, you may think to yourself, this book is only 15 bucks on Kindle. Why doesn't the library just buy another copy? But if I were to purchase an ebook copy of Lessons in Chemistry for the library, I would have to spend $55 on just a license. After two years, this license would expire and I would have to spend $55 all over again. This is why libraries can't keep up with ebook demand. Paying $110 for an ebook over and over again devastates our digital materials budget. Because of this example, I urge you to support HB 6800 and its work towards setting fair contract terms for ebook licensing. It would help authors as they receive royalties on a per copy sold basis. This would allow libraries to purchase more copies. It would help patrons because they would receive their ebooks in a timely manner. And it would help libraries build meaningful and complete collections that meet the demands of their community. We want to support authors and publishers. We want to build robust digital library collections. We want to serve our communities through equal access. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much. And I'm loving the Mark Twain print behind you. <laughs> uh, thank so you. No questions at this time. We certainly uh, have heard a lot of good testimony like yours today. And, and we thank you for being here and have a great weekend. Up next, we have Margarita Albin, followed by Ellen Paul. Good afternoon, co-chairs Raman and Carlos de Graw, vice chairs Chaffee and Needleman, ranking members Zulo and Fazio and other members of the Planning and Development Committee. My name is Margarita Alban, and I am chair of the Greenwich Planning and Zoning Commission, but I am here speaking as a private citizen. And please don't hold against me that I'm from Greenwich because it happens a lot. I'm here to comment on SB 1141. I echo much, I would echo much of what others have said. I oppose as of right and I oppose punitive measures and mandates that take away local control. However, the main point I'd like to make to you now is that transit-oriented development is at best today an incomplete concept for planning purposes, and at worst, it is backward-looking and flawed. And I say that because we are now at a time when we should be focusing instead on walkability and reducing the reliance on vehicles. I can give you examples of that. I have two major developments coming into our very walkable access to work, access to shopping town center. They are both more than half a mile from the train station, and yet they would serve the long-term goals of increasing affordability. One is coming in at 40% affordable, Another, we're still working on it, but we think it'll be at least 20%. And that those are the kinds of projects that we should be encouraging at the local level. This bill and some others that you have seen and will see 
proposed to take that away from us. I spent a lot of time mapping where people come from to work in my town. And they come from areas that are not served by transit and work in positions that are not accessed by transit. So finding walkability at one end is the goal. Uh, I also remind you that Metro North is still experiencing only 70% of its pre-pandemic ridership and that Metro North tends to serve a more affluent community, which is not where our greatest housing shortage is. And that's all. Thank you very much for listening to me and giving me the time. Uh, Ms. Alban, I really appreciate your testimony, especially because you mentioned um, walkable projects. And I also would add to that rideable in terms of bikeable projects. Um, I think that you, you're, you hit the nail on the head that we've really focused on um, automobile <laughs> development for, for too long a time. So I do thank you for being here today. I, I will say that your senator probably has a question or two for you, Senator Fazio. Well, I just wanted to say, Margarita, that I don't actually hold it against you that you're from Greenwich. Um, <laughs> But hey, me either. Yeah. <laughs> but and the, the good chairwoman says says neither. How about your representative? He he's he's demurring. <laughs> well, well, two to one ain't bad. Two to one passes the and bipartisan. <laughs> yes, it is bipartisan <laughs> across the aisle. Um, Thank you. can you just speak to what can you know? Obviously, uh one one four one is is kind of a cut and dry rule, half mile radius within transit uh stations. And you have, as of right, up to, uh, what, 15 units an acre. So it's pretty cut and dry, and there's not a lot of flexibility. Can you tell us what type of considerations you look at when you're, when you're um, considering on the PNZ Commission a, um, a proposed a permit, building permit um, or, or a permit within a half a mile of a transit station or anywhere else that, that would be complicated? by as of right uh, up to 15 units per acre. Yes, sir, thank you very much. We consider the interface of the environmental issues, the wetlands issues, the traffic issues, where driveways should be, where the, where the setbacks should be. There just a, there's a lot of areas where you can make a proposal so much better by looking at how all the expertise interfaces. What's your traffic comments? How could you address those better? A stop sign here, reaching out to other departments and improving the project. We, we actively do that. I know that all the towns that are densely developed feel the same way that you can make a project so much better and so much more serviceable for its, for its uh, residents in that manner. Did that answer? Yes, it does. And the only, um, I think the only carve out in 1141 uh, is wetlands among those that yes. you mentioned, but as you and pointed out, it's complicated. Um, yes. so, so precluding any of those considerations from local leaders um, is problematic, especially when it probably would take away your willingness as a town, so the royal you, willingness as a town, to look towards those better situated developments that you mentioned, which are more than half a mile outside the radius, that are walkable, um, you know, that that fit in better with the, the town plans and, um, and the town's needs. So a, as you point out, it's good that we have... Um, uh, that we have the flexibility and uh, we're also lucky in, in my neck of the woods to have very considerate and balanced zoning officials and housing authority officials that are helping to create more affordable housing and also take into the considerations, the, uh, the input of the community in doing so. So thank you for your time and have a great weekend. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Seeing no other questions at this time, well, thank you for your testimony and have a wonderful afternoon. Uh, up next, we have Ellen Paul, filed, followed by Kenneth Pascal. Welcome. Honorable members of the Planning and Development Committee, thank you so much for letting me speak today. I am here in support of uh, House Bill 6800 on library ebooks. I know we have heard a lot about this today. Um, my name is Ellen Paul. I am the Executive Director of the Connecticut Library Consortium. We serve over 950 libraries across the state of Connecticut. 
uh, all of our public libraries, academic libraries, school libraries from Greenwich to Woodstock. Um, and every day I negotiate publicly bid contracts that libraries buy off of. And you actually pay me to do that work. We were established by Connecticut General Statute 11-9E in 1975, and we are partially funded by a line item of the same name in the Connecticut State Library budget. Um, our job is to negotiate those publicly bid contracts that adhere to municipal, federal, and state procurement law. The state has the Department of Administrative Services libraries have the Connecticut Library Consortium. If you go into any public library across the state of Connecticut and pick up a physical book, you can be assured that that library didn't pay full price for it. They paid about 50% off and they bought it off of our contracts. But when we talk about eBooks, the same thing, the same rules, they just don't apply. As you have heard from my colleagues, these libraries, they pay six times what general consumers pay for the same product, and then that ebook disappears after two years or a certain an amount of borrows. Somehow, ebook vendors and publishers have been able to skirt procurement law for the past 20 years. And we believe that with this bill, HB 6800, that begins to change. Libraries across the state spend state, federal, and municipal dollars on ebooks. The state of Connecticut absolutely has the purview and an interest in regulating these contracts to ensure that those tax dollars are spent responsibly. If the Department of Transportation was forced to pay six times more than the general contractor making driveways for asphalt, and then those roads disappeared after two years, the state would not stand for that. Libraries spend state dollars on eBooks. We should not stand for those contract terms either. I appreciate your support and your time today. Thank you so much. And thank you for hanging with us all day today. I think that's a, an excellent analogy that you gave at the end about the roads, because you're right. We would freak out <laughs> if we had paid for those roads and they disappeared. So. Uh, any questions? Senator Wong. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. And, and before I begin, I, I just wanted to also thank the Madam Chair for her uh, patience and acknowledgement and support of libraries. Uh, your enthusiasm is infectious. So I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, Ms. Paul, you represent the consortium of libraries. So you kind of utilize group purchasing powers and negotiations on contracts with vendors, not just publishers of books, right, for services or, um, you know, economy of scale and, and, and try to save money for our value libraries. That's your role. And it's important. And, and I appreciate that you came back from DC to testify and, and participate today. But talk about the previous cases in Maryland and in New York and how Maryland was uh, rejected by the court and how New York was um, vetoed by Governor Hochul. And tell this committee the lessons you have learned and that intentional crafting of House Bill 6800 this year with the lessons learned and with the attorneys and inputs that you've had to, to not confront the challenge of preemption of copyright protection, but focus on contract law. Many of your colleagues have mentioned that, but in your role as kind of the group consortium purchasing power, I, I wanted to hear from you the negotiations and the articulation of the differences between contract law and preemption of copyrights. Thank you for that opportunity. So to start with, yes, our organization has over 100 publicly bid contracts for the things that libraries buy every day. Furniture, equipment, technology, supplies, DVDs, books, you know, if a library can buy it, we're going to have a contract for it. And so, yes, I do work very closely with vendors. We put out public bids 
we stipulate terms and conditions that they must adhere to, and we receive those bids back and evaluate them, right? And so amongst the terms and conditions that they have to adhere to, those are some terms and conditions that the state says. You have to give us a non-discrimination statement. You have to... Um, uh, you had to affirm that you have read the state ethics laws. Um, the terms of this contract are disclosable, right? Um, the ebook vendors have refused to come to the table. They refuse to bid. They refuse to sign these terms. They refuse to follow procurement law. Um, and I do want to just note that I am based here in Connecticut. I was in DC just talking to our legislators about federal funding on uh, on libraries. Um, but I'm I'm very glad to be back here and to talk about this uh, this bill because you're right, it is not copyright. The problem with Ma the Maryland bill said you must sell in the state of Maryland by these terms, and this is not what this that is not what this bill says. This bill says, if you want to participate in the marketplace in Connecticut, if you want to sell to libraries in Connecticut, you must meet these terms, right? And we do this every single day. If you want to sell road salt to the state of Connecticut, you need to follow these terms. The vendor doesn't set the terms, the state of Connecticut sets the terms. You can, you know, talk to the Department of, um, you know, Administrative Services um, about how long those contracts are, right? Um, so I kind of equate it to like when California says, you know, if you want to sell cars in the state of California, they need to, the, you need to set that um, certain gas mileage there. They're not telling Ford that they have to sell into California. They're saying to Ford, if you want to sell into California, these are the terms and the conditions that you need to meet. And that is essentially the same thing that we are doing here. Thank you. And, and I appreciate the articulation and I, uh, because sometimes language and it's a written into language into our bills don't reflect that. I, I appreciate your clarity. For legislative intent. Uh, we have great uh, legislative attorneys, but it's important through this public hearing process to hear about legislative intent, which you just crafted, the distinct differentiation. Now, you represent a consortium libraries. Do you have higher lobbyists to advocate for what you do? I wish I had that money, but no, we are just here as an organized grassroots effort of librarians from across the state and across the board we've heard other testimonies and and there are members that are in various committees that could be at, at any very time as i've kind of come in and out but there are many variances of libraries and their ability to fund their ability to have resources and you see it all but there's one unifying point and, and that is that all of them derive their funding from their municipalities of base. Associations, uh, public libraries, they all do. And this cost is an expense to municipal taxpayers. One, two, it takes away critical services that your libraries could provide as part of the community service. It's, it's a double downside. It's not just that they're charging these excessive disparity in prices. They are denying an opportunity for services in the community, and you are taking away municipal taxes and revenue from the community. I'll tell you a story. Before I was um, here at the Connecticut Library Consortium, I was the director, the library director in the town of East Hampton. And when I started there, um, we started up an ebook program and I put aside $6,000 for that program. And people in East Hampton just loved it. And demand just kept going up and up and up. Um, and I would, I would call it feeding the beast 
because I needed to come up with more money to meet the demand of people. And so I'm, I'm ashamed to say it, but I canceled databases. I canceled research databases so that I could move money over to be the beast of these ebook vendors. By the time I left East Hampton, which was in um, uh, just over a year or so ago, um, that $6,000 bill had grown to $14,000. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Paul, for your work and, uh, and your time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would say especially thank you for your time because I know <laughs> from all the librarians how hard you work and you've been with us all day. So thank you again. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Uh, up next, number 38, Kenneth Pascal. I am not seeing Kenneth in our Zoom room. So up next, we have John Guskowski. Nice to see you again. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members of the Planning and Development Committee. I appreciate um, the opportunity to um, testify before you. Uh, my name is John Guskowski. I'm a certified planner and a certified zoning enforcement officer. I'm testifying today on behalf of the Connecticut chapter of the American Planning Association, CCAPA. We are a membership organization of over 400 professional land use, uh, economic development, environmental, transportation, and community planners in both um, the public and private sector. Um, we are, uh, in fact, the local experts that um, Ms. Uh, Alexis Harrison referred to earlier and encouraged the Planning and Development Committee to um, confer with on these uh, matters. Um, we have submitted testimony on three bills that I'm going to uh, go through briefly today. Uh, first is uh, Senate Bill 1137, an act concerning short-term rental facilitators and properties. Um, briefly, we support this bill. Uh, short-term rentals have been a very tricky issue for many communities, uh, particularly in more popular um, shoreline and sort of vacation towns. Uh, both in defining the problem, regulating it, and enforcing it has been a challenge, um, and it can be very much like whack-a-mole um, for our um, planning and zoning uh, community. And this bill basically provides the authority for municipalities to receive some tax revenue as well as to obtain outside support to deal with this issue. Uh, and that just makes good sense. It's, it's, it's good enabling legislation. Um, second, there are uh, basically two uh, transit-oriented development uh, related bills. Senate Bill 1141, uh, an act concerning transit-oriented development. Um, while we at CCAPA strongly support the concept of increasing municipal responsibility to achieve higher density residential development, particularly in TOD areas. Um, this proposal is a holdover from a couple of previous legislative sessions, and it does not reflect um, the most current approach uh, to, to TOD zoning. Um, the bill overrides local zoning to require a minimum residential TOD, um, uh, residential density in TOD areas in a way that's not um, responsive enough or, or considerate enough of local conditions uh, and infrastructure capacity. Um, this bill's original proponents um, have sort of evolved their proposals to be more of a locally led uh, process and analysis. And we would recommend that the committee um, disregard this bill in favor of um, looking more favorably on some of the more uh, evolutionary uh, versions of uh, TOD. Um, and finally, uh, for Governor's bill, uh, 985 and act incentivizing housing production. Um, we uh, support the broad intent of this bill uh, of one of encouraging affordable housing and housing development generally, um, particularly encouraging as of right uh, middle housing and providing significant matching funds or funding resources from the state. Um, those are critical um, support components for a multifaceted state approach to housing development that we need. Um, we do have concerns of this bill, again, 985, um, because the local, the primary local authority in this bill to establish one of the housing growth zones is delegated to the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, which is an odd decision. Three it doesn't really is make, complete. Uh, okay, it doesn't really make sense, and we, we feel like um, it bypasses the more relevant commissions, planning and zoning, who are more natural authorities on this. Um, so that the component of the bill should be reconsidered. Um, and overall, um, when we are adopting laws regarding local housing development, the state does need to use a combination of carrots and sticks, and Please neither of these two comments. bills um, quite get it right. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing no questions at this time, thank you for being here today. And uh, we'll read the rest of your testimony. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, up next, we have Kate. Oh, I'm not going to get this right. By road. Thank you so much. <laughs> Just like a street, followed by Alan Osborne. 
Good afternoon, Senator um, Fazio, Representative Del Nicky, Senator Wong, oh, he left, um, and Representative Carlos de Gras. Um, my name is Kate Byrode, and I'm the director of the Cragen Memorial Library in Colchester, and I'm a resident of West Hartford. I'm here in support of House Bill 6800. I want to thank you for raising the bill in this committee and appreciate your support last year with this issue. Thank you for listening to my friends and colleagues explain how the issue impacts their ability to serve their committees, communities. My summary here is this. I believe that the publishers are taking advantage of their legal monopoly to inhibit the marketplace. After all, my colleagues and I can purchase physical books and other materials at prices substantially below the list price, thanks to statewide contracts. In those cases, both the publisher and distributors have made their profit and authors have received their royalties. Everyone has gotten paid. This is true despite the costs of printing, manufacturing, marketing, and shipping. However, with digital materials, we're paying several times the consumer's list price for eBooks for the same product. We loan them one at a time, just like physical materials. We aren't receiving any special features or bonus materials. We don't even have the ability to build meaningful collections because as you know by now, the license typically expires at 24 months. I can't even shop around for better prices because even if I chose another aggregator, the equivalent of a wholesale distributor, the prices and terms would be the same. In contrast, I have a choice of distributors for physical materials, and I am offered a range of discounts on the books I purchase from them. All of this works against our mission to serve the public and our responsibility to taxpayers to steward their money well. It's reached the point for me that I spend very little on digital materials, even though I know Colchester's residents want them because they are so unaffordable. For contrast, my friend Doug Lord from Newtown told you he has $52,000 a year to spend on digital materials. While in Colchester, I have a book budget of $53,000 a year to spend on everything. Read through and review the testimony of my colleagues. Our story explains that Connecticut has a role in cutting through these trade practices to provide better, fairer terms for Connecticut's taxpayers, for public libraries, school libraries, college libraries, and even the state library itself. We believe better terms would make for better libraries for our communities. We believe better terms would result in more royalties for authors and continued profits for publishers. I believe HB 6800 would put Connecticut on the road to better stewardship of taxpayer dollars. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, not seeing any questions, but I will say this because I think you're our last librarian today. Yes. Um, I think that we, I think the, the last thing that you said really struck me about your 53,000 for your entire budget versus Doug's 52,000 for just his, you know, electronic uh, online budget, so to speak. Yeah. Um, that is an enormous gap in equity. And if the publishers care about nothing else, they ought to care about the fact that if the printed word isn't getting out there to more people and the word of mouth that really is advertising among book lovers, they yeah. should really care about that. Because if you can't stock it, people can't read it. And that means they're not going to be selling right. much more. So, uh, and there's and, no bookstore in Colchester. <laughs> yeah. We're it, right. we market stuff. I, that's a whole other conversation about yeah. the loss of our independent bookstores. But but I do agree that th this is this is something that if, if we don't tackle it now, I just don't know how we're going to continue like this because we can't. So right. thank you so much for, uh, I, I'm sorry, Rep I must have sp sparked something in Representative Delnicki as I was talking. <laughs> One very simple question. And it dawned on me. Yes. You, you made a comment about regardless of who you're buying the electronic books from, mm -hmm. they're all the same price. Yep. So they're colluding on the price. I'm not a lawyer. Not I don't even play audience. one on TV. But, but yes, if I and I know this because I can I can see um, I can see one vendor who sells me both physical and, and would sell me electronic um, materials and the pricing for the electronic materials is the same as the vendor I actually do purchase from title by title. Really? Yes. So so then conceivably yeah. there is price fixing going on. I'm not an we can only attorney. Speculate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I thank you for that, uh, that testimony, especially that comment there pertaining to uh, the uniformity in prices. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep.
Fascinating. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, we I do not see Ellen Osborne in our Zoom room. We do have uh, number 42, Rory Whalen, and then I will circle back to number 34, Anne Minuski. Mr. Whalen. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Rory Whalen, Regional Vice President of the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies. We represent more than 1,500 members, big, small, and in between uh, throughout the country. Uh, and many in Connecticut. As you know, Connecticut is, insurance industry is very important to the Connecticut economy. We, our industry provides $200 million to the state in premium taxes and employ uh, nearly 70,000 Connecticut residents. Uh, I appreciate the sponsor's attempt to provide relief to municipalities and taxpayers. Uh, but in this case, to, to, to paraphrase Virgil, the, the remedy is worse than the problem. Uh, and that is, it does the opposite. This would put municipalities, taxpayers, and workers in jeopardy. Uh, and I want to underscore, and, and uh, this is all I'll have to say and have to take questions, but I really want to underscore the importance in the surety bond process of vetting these contractors. Um, it, it is critically important, uh, whether it's the best of intentions uh, on the part of municipal uh, officials could be ruined by bad characters who are not properly vetted. Uh, with that, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, and I apologize for not pointing out, uh, this is in opposition to 1135. Uh, and that is the surety bond bill that you've heard uh, much about today. I actually think sometimes it's better when you say it at the end because it's a good reminder for us. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I am not seeing any questions at this time, but I do appreciate your testimony. I appreciate you hanging in with us because you are now our second to last. So it's been a long day for you too, I'm sure. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend. Okay, number 34, Ann Minuski, please. Oops. We can hear you. You can hear me. I almost, I almost pushed cancel, sorry. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairman and members of the Planning and Development Committee. The Connecticut Republican Assembly is an organization which has members and friends totaling over 500 Republicans and conservatives across the eight counties of Connecticut. We stand firm in our principles and unalienable rights under the U.S. Constitution, as well as the rights and responsibilities within the Connecticut Constitution. I'm Ann Minuski, a 24-year resident. I need to change that to 25. Former licensed professional counselor and current president of the Connecticut Republican Assembly. I am speaking in regard to HB uh, 1141 and also SB 985. Uh, I am uh, opposing both of them in regard to the fact that these bills originate from the Regional Plan Association New York, which has a Connecticut campaign, Desegregate Connecticut. This is a usurpation of our sovereign Connecticut state. The Connecticut Gen General Assembly must do a better job in reviewing bill concepts for its validity under the Connecticut Constitution. I'm sorry, include the lawyers for the Connecticut General Assembly. This is about the fourth piece of testimony, some with multiple bills which have been written and raised as a bill, yet vol violates our sovereign state. Please vote no on this. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Seeing no questions at this time, you are our last testifier of the day. We thank everyone so much for being here to both testify and to listen to testimony. And I wish everyone a wonderful weekend of rest. Take care.